order the meeting of the Board of Education of Baltimore County for Tuesday, December 18th, 2018. I invite you to rise and recite the Pledge of Allegiance to the flag to be led by Jordan Goddard. First, it will be in Spanish and then in English. We will then remain standing for a moment of silence in recognition of those who have served education of Baltimore County. Yo juro fidelidad a la bandera de los Estados Unidos de América y a la república que representa una nación bajo Dios, indivisible, con libertad y justicia para todos. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Gracias. Are there any additions or changes to tonight's agenda, Ms. White? Yes, I would like to add item C2, Superintendent's Report on Blue Ribbon Award. To In accordance with board policy 8314, during a regular board meeting, items may be added to the agenda by unanimous consent of the board members present. All in favor of adding item C2, Superintendent's Report, please raise your hand. All 12 have voted. Ms. White? Excuse me. First, we're going to move to the selection of the speakers. Ms. Adekoya. The first speaker is Jordan Goddard. Our next speaker is Jennifer Weaver. The third speaker is Marilyn Uman. Our fourth speaker is Colleen Carr. Our fifth speaker is Brenda Pfeiffer. Our sixth speaker is Deborah Brewer. Our next speaker is Sarah Gonzalez. Jason Garber. Ryan Riddle. Is that 10? And that is 10. That's nine. Hi there. Thank you, Ms. Adekoya. Our final speaker, speaker is Diana Bergman. Okay, thank you. We're going to, uh, mm -hmm. in just a moment, we're going, first we're going to conclude a little business, which is the minutes of the closed session. Earlier this evening, the board met in closed session pursuant to the Opens Meetings Act for the following reasons. To discuss, one, the appointment, employment, assignment, promotion, discipline, demotion, compensation, removal, resignation, or performance evaluation of appointees, employees, or officials over whom it has jurisdiction, or any other personnel matter that affects one or more specific individuals, and seven, consult with counsel to obtain legal advice. The minutes of the closed session and informational summary can be found on our website at www.bcps.org backslash board backslash informational summaries dot html. Sign up cards were available to the public uh, prior to this evening. Board practice limits to 10 the number of speakers at a regularly scheduled board meeting. Each speaker is allowed three minutes to address the board and we have uh, drawn from our box. And before we do the speakers, we are going to have the superintendent's report. Thank you. Thank you. So happy holidays, everyone. Because just this morning, the Maryland State Department of Education announced that Pinewood Elementary is the 25th Maryland Blue Ribbon School in BCPS.
Pinewood was selected in the category of exemplary high achieving school. On the park assessment, 84.4% of Pinewood students scored proficient or higher in mathematics and English language arts. Uh, the school attendance rate of 96% exceeds the state standard. According to the new Maryland report card, Pinewood earned five out of five stars and a percentile rank of 99%. So these are the accomplishments that have made that make a huge difference in the lives of our children. Last week I shared the good news related to student performance in BCPS and this week's good news about Pinewood is yet another reason why so many residents in Baltimore <laughs> County continue to choose BCPS to educate their children. So congratulations to Principal Tricia Reeder, her staff and the wonderful students and families of Pinewood for this achievement. And again I'd like to wish all of BCPS a very happy holidays. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. White. And the board echoes our congratulations to Ms. Reuter and all of the team at Pinewood Elementary. They're doing fantastic work like so many all around the county. So we're really, um, we're really proud of them. So our next item is public comment. This is one of the board, uh, the opportunities the board provides to hear the views and receive the advice of community members. The members of the board appreciate hearing from interested citizens. As appropriate, we will refer your concerns to the interim superintendent for follow-up by her staff. While we encourage public input on policy programs and practices within the purview of this board and this school system, this is not the proper form to address specific student or employee matters or to comment on matters that do not relate to public education in Baltimore County. We encourage everyone to utilize existing dispute resolution processes as appropriate. I remind everyone that inappropriate personal remarks or other behavior that disrupts or interferes with the conduct of this meeting are out of order. I ask you to observe the three minute clock, which will let you know when your time is up. Please conclude your remarks when you hear the bell or see that time has expired. The microphone will be turned off at the end of your time, and it could be turned off if a speaker addresses specific student or employee matters or is commenting on matters not related to public education <laughs> in Baltimore County. I now call on our advisory groups to speak, and we're going to start off this evening with one of our elected officials, Delegate-Elect, Dr. Michelle Guyton, representing District 42B. Good, Good evening, evening, Dr. Guyton. Chairwoman Causey, Vice Chairwoman Hen, Superintendent White, and members of the board, I'm very excited to speak with you this evening. I'm Dr. Michelle Guyton. I am an outgoing member of the State Board of Education and a delegate elect for 42B, which is right here in Baltimore County. So I have. Um, been working on educational policy my whole life. Policy, particularly efforts to support school safety initiatives and the academic, emotional, and social needs of all of our students has been my life's work and passion. And I look forward to continuing my commitment to our public schools as a member of the House Ways and Means Committee Education Subcommittee. I look forward to working collaboratively with your board on these and many other issues. I'm specifically here today to speak on behalf of the many Delaney High School families who make up my constituency in 42B. I've had the privilege to hear from families and community members about the current unsafe and aging infrastructure at Delaney High School and to witness these deplorable conditions for myself. Two thirds of that building is without air conditioning and that is why they were unable to start the school year on time. Their water has been discolored since at least 1999 due to the conditions of the cast iron pipes. And the original electric wiring is 24 years past its life expectancy. And I think we've probably all heard stories of the infamous electrified fields there. I know personally of instances um, where teachers, plural, have been bitten by rodents at Delaney. As a BCPS parent myself, I'm grateful that my own children have benefited from recent renovations to Hereford High School, completed in 2014. It was a comprehensive renovation and addition that cost $51.1 million. 
It allowed for newer common areas and renovated classrooms. Unfortunately, no comparable renovation has been offered to Delaney High School to date, and a comparable renovation would cost now more than $90 million and would still not resolve the Delaney High School space deficit of 47,000 square feet. As both a taxpayer and a public servant who's committed to using our public funds wisely, this option just does not make economic sense to me. I'm asking that my voice be added to the many you've already heard so that you will include a replacement school for Delaney High School in your next county capital request. As a state legislator, I'll partner with my county delegation to support increased funding for school construction at the state level. And working together, we can ensure that no family in our county has to decide between inadequate facilities or inadequate instruction. We have a responsibility to provide both adequate facilities and instruction to our students. Thank you for your time and I wish you all the best in the new year and I sincerely look forward to working with all of you. Thanks. Thank you. And next from Baltimore County Student Council, the Superintendent Student Advisory Council, Ruben Amaya. Good evening. Good evening. Good evening, members of the board. Uh, I first want to say congratulations to the newly appointed and newly elected members of the board. Uh, my name is Ruben Amaya, and I serve as the president for the Baltimore County Student Councils. Um, just to talk about a little bit of what we've been doing. Uh, just yesterday, we hosted our first general assembly. Uh, and essentially what that is, is we meet with every high school and middle school student council from around the county. Uh, and we work to discuss about issues and concerns that are facing students and how we can bring solutions to the table. Uh, and I want to give a sincere thank you to to Superintendent White, uh, County Executive Johnny Olszewski, and former County Councilwoman uh, Vicki Allman for coming uh, and speaking to our students. Um, I know that, uh, in my opinion, I think that was one of our best General Assemblies in a very long time. Uh, I think the students really connected uh, with the words and wisdoms that they provided and uh, provided some uh, inspiration for them so that they can see that they can fill those shoes as well, uh, being part of the BCPS community. Uh, as well as last week, uh, a few of our members uh, on the executive board uh, were able to sit down with Ms. White um, and discuss issues that are facing students in our county, such as school safety, uh, mental health, and curriculum. Uh, and we were able to discuss some ways on how we can also bring solutions to the table as well. Uh, I am really excited for the new year ahead working with you all, uh, and I hope we can accomplish some amazing things. Thank you. Thank you very much. Next, we have Ms. Abby Baton from TAPCO. Good evening, Chairwoman Causey, Vice Chairwoman Hen, Ms. White, and members of the board. As we are entering the final stretch of 2018, it is customary to look back to assess the year. This has been a year of some horrific events as well as joyous events. There are, there are some events that we are uncertain as to their importance and what the final outcomes may be even now. One thing is for certain, education has steadily held the top spot in most people's minds. Your new positions as Baltimore County School Board members come with great responsibility, but also with great hopes. To that end, it is quite evident that funding continues to be an issue. We know that the Kerwin Commission has detailed the shortfall of funds for public education and has made many recommendations to the General Assembly on how to address the top issues. We know that it will take the will of the people to make these changes for the betterment of our students. I have shared many times with the Board of Education the myriad of changes and resources we would like to see put in place. We also know these items often come with a hefty price tag. Where better to spend it than on our kids? On the evening of Monday, March 11th, there will be a rally held in Annapolis to ask legislators to fully fund the Kerwin Commission requests. We have already worked to pass the funding lockbox for education in this past election. However, it was just the first step. We are asking you to join us in Annapolis for the rally for public education. We already have the county executive committing to marching with us. We are going to take several buses to Annapolis and welcome you, our school leaders, as well as community members and others to join with us. 
We need to send a message that public education is the great equalizer and full funding is crucial to fulfill the promise. Please save the date, Monday, March 11th, and hop on one of our buses to stand shoulder to shoulder with other public education advocates. And of course, happy holidays, and I hope everyone has a restful break because many of us really need it. Thanks. Thank you very much. PTA Council of Baltimore County, we have Dr. Cynthia Boyd. Good evening. Good evening um, and welcome to, um, to all the new members and um, uh, happy holidays to you all. I'm here speaking tonight on behalf of Jane Lee, President of the PTA Council of Baltimore County and as co-chair of the Health and Safety Committee of PTA Council with Andrew Broadwater. PTA Council of Baltimore County is the largest and oldest group representing the voice of parents. We have heard many times over the past several years about concerns related to health and safety. Tonight, we will focus on health and safety concerns we have heard regarding the STAT initiative. Parents have shared many concerns with us over the past five years. First and foremost has been the inability of parents to give feedback about the initiative. Save for a few small focus groups which are either not open to all or poorly advertised, there's been no opportunity for unbiased feedback from parents on the initiative. The annual stakeholder survey from BCPS um, it has included two questions about the STAT initiative, but these questions are very biased in favor of technology and are also made up of educational lingo that is complicated and confusing. The recent piece in the Baltimore Sun highlighted some of the concerns we have heard and we are going to share a few more thoughts about the initiative. First and foremost is to please include parents in the conversation in meaningful and unbiased ways. Second, PTA Council of Baltimore County voted to support a bill that was finally passed and signed by the governor this past year that requires the Maryland Department of Health to develop guidelines for the safe and healthy use of technology in public schools in Maryland. As the first bill of its kind in the country, the bill was written about in the New York Times. PTA Council of Baltimore County's advocacy for this bill was strongly supported and represents countless hours of volunteer advocacy. We are looking forward to the recommendations and hope that Baltimore County will be a leader in this regard by clearly, transparently, and effectively addressing parental concerns about health and safety. Third, beyond health and safety issues, parents have shared concerns about changes to education experienced through their children by their children through STAT. Parents were not included as a stakeholder of the Johns Hopkins evaluation. Parents would like an unbiased examination of the initiative software, programs, and implementation, including educational outcomes, and overall, for their voice to be heard. Thank you very much, and happy holidays. Thank you. And, that, um, and from the Northwest um, Area Advisory Council, we have Mr. Clifford Collins. Good evening. Good evening. Good evening, Board Chair Kelsey, Vice Chair Julie Henn, Superintendent Verlita White, and members of the Baltimore County Board of Education. Congratulations on your election or appointment to this distinguished body. I am Clifford Collins, Chair of the Northwest Area, uh, Northwest Area Education Advisory Council. This evening, I am prepared to inform you of a new day in the Northwest Area. We are witnessing a continuing resurgence of advocacy and support for quality education in the Northwest communities. For too long, public education policies and practices have denied a wholesome quality education experience for far too many of our most vulnerable students in Baltimore County, especially those living in Owings Mills, Bikesville, and Randallstown. We all know why this crisis exists. The big question is, what are we collectively going to do about it? I urge the new board leadership to refrain from advocating for and adopting policies and making decisions that appear to be or are conflict of interest, self-serving, and potentially disruptive to the functions of school system administrators and most importantly, the education of Baltimore County students. Some of these practices were a trademark of a minority of members of this previous board and should not be repeated. 
this school year, our advisory council is devoting our attention to one of the school system's top priorities, school climate. Members of our advisory council have been selected to serve on the board's advisory committee on school climate and the superintendent's student behavior and discipline council. Last month, we hosted a public meeting on school climate and safety. In January, we will host a public meeting on the proposed extent expansion of career and technical education in the Northwest area. Local community organizations, including the NAACP and other organizations, have met with school officials and members of our, of our advisory council to discuss school system priorities and commit to supporting those initiatives in the Northwest area. In closing, I wish to thank Verlita White for her vision, goals, and commitment to literacy across the curriculum and school safety. I also commend Ms. White for establishing the Division of Climate and Safety. I encourage the board, schools, administrators, and staff, and stakeholders in all Baltimore County communities to embrace this, this mission, and I quote, to work diligently to ensure every school is a positive and welcoming environment for teaching and learning, while supporting the physical, social, emotional, well. Thank you very much. And now we're going to have our um, other stakeholders. And number one, we have Jordan Goddard. Good evening, everyone. Um, my name is Jordan Goddard, and I am a fourth grade teacher at Pleasant Plains Elementary School, and it is my pleasure to speak to you on behalf of the students at my school, parents, as well as the teachers. I'd first like to congratulate the new members of the board, particularly Mrs. Hen and Mrs. Rowe, whose constituency includes Pleasant Plains. I am one of the first from my school to bring the subject of over overcrowding at Pleasant Plains to the board's attention. Pleasant Plains Elementary was opened in 1958 and underwent a small expansion in 1974. As it stands, we currently have five portable classrooms and a state-rated capacity of 509 students. But as of this morning, more than 700 students are enrolled in our Title I supported school, meaning that we have reached a 138% capacity increase. Um, I am a six-year teacher, but I will painfully and regrettably admit that my first year here with Team BCPS has been one of the most difficult of all of them, and that these difficulties are directly related to my increased class size and lack of staffing to handle our current population. I currently house 32 fourth graders in my small classroom, a number of whom enter crisis mode several times per week, and as recently as today, uh, pose a danger to other students, certainly causing a detriment to their academic progress. I find myself saying to those who ask how my day went, uh, well, it was okay, uh, but there really are just too many of them. There are just too many students, and unfortunately, I am not the only teacher who would agree with that sentiment at my school. Um, I always intended to be a teacher uh, for the rest of my life, but I am burnt out and I am exhausted by the sheer number of students that pass through our halls and our lunchrooms, and I am looking for a solution uh, along with many of the members of my school behind me. I sincerely thank the board for their consideration and intention in this matter, as it is of the utmost importance to me and to the success of my students who I'm lucky to call my own. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Goddard. Next we have Jennifer Weaver. Good evening. Hi. Good evening, board members. Uh, my name is Jennifer Weaver. I am the secretary of the Pleasant Plains Elementary School PTA and a proud parent of a second grader at that school. Although I couldn't be happier that my daughter attends a school with such a hardworking and caring staff, some of whom are here tonight after their long work day, 
I am incredibly concerned about uh, the overcrowding at our school. As of last week, Pleasant Plains enrollment reached 138% of state rated capacity. There are over 700 children in a school built in 1958 and expanded in 1974 to hold only 509. Since 2008, when the board completed an assessment of the Towson area elementary schools, Pleasant Plains enrollment has steadily increased. In that assessment, our building was rated as the least difficult to expand. A permanent solution, though, has yet to be offered to our community. I'm grateful to Ms. Christina Byers and Ms. Heidi Miller for their attention to our concerns and request that the board help them in their continued support of our school administration. I would also like the board to closely examine the process that is used to determine projected enrollment. I've distributed to the board members a fact sheet which includes a graph that clearly shows our actual enrollment trends over the last 10 years in direct contrast to the projected enrollment. Over the last few years, these inaccurate projections have resulted in hiring additional kindergarten and fourth grade teachers, for example, after the school year began, as well as five relocatables being placed on our property. Please remember Pleasant Plains Elementary School as you consider solutions to district overcrowding and facilities improvement. Thank you. Thank you. And next we have Colleen, excuse me, Marilyn Umar. Good evening. Good evening. I am here representing the teachers, the parents, and the students of Franklin Middle School in Reicherstown. We are a large 1,300 student middle school with a very diverse student population. Our school has a very negative reputation in our community that we are working hard to change. We scored a two on the Maryland report card and we want to change that too. We have a new principal as of last year, Mr. Schiffer, who is working hard to make positive changes in our school. We have a number of highly motivated and dedicated teachers who are trying to deal with tough conditions. We have a more active PTA starting this year who is working hard to help support our school but we can't do it alone. We need your help. We have too many kids in our classrooms with many having over 30 students per teacher. We have too few teachers with many classes having long-term subs or revolving subs. We do not have the behavioral support we need and have a small group of students causing disruptions in the hallways and classrooms. Our school has been making many positive steps forward with the, with the resources we do have. We were granted a BLS program but not given the staffing to make it work. We now have a restoration room but we need another behavioral interventionist who can go into the classrooms to help the teachers with disruptive students. We have a part-time psychologist, but have a significant number of kids who would benefit from having a full-time psychologist in the building. Our facility staff works very hard to keep our building clean and running well, but our school looks like a bad school, which affects our students, our teachers, and our parents. We are trying to start a drama program and bring in assemblies for our students, but our auditorium has been deemed unsafe for at least two years, and we are on a lengthy, lengthy list for repair. Our teachers are doing their best to teach our students and remain positive, but some of them have left. We have a large turnover rate. It is hard also to keep
to bring a quality education to all our students. Thank you. And anytime folks have additional information, they can uh, submit it to the board. Our next speaker is Colleen Carr. Good evening. Good evening. Good evening to all of you and thank you for your time and attention. My name is Colleen Carr and I'm a parent of a first grader at Pleasant Plains Elementary School. I'm here along with several others on behalf of our students, parents, and staff at the school. I am here to draw attention to significant capacity and facility concerns at Pleasant Plains and to ask the board to consider both short and long-term solutions to address our needs. <coughs> Our school is located in the Lock Raven Village neighborhood and serves several communities between Towson and Parkville. Our state rated capacity, as you've heard, is 509 students, yet our enrollment sits at just over 700 or 138% of that capacity. Historical and future projections from the school system have predicted declining enrollment. However, school enrollment data show quite the opposite year over year and even quarter over quarter. Pleasant Plains is a school rich in diversity, diversity of culture, ethnicity, language, and socioeconomic status. As such, the needs of our students are wide ranging. We would argue that the current staffing model does not adequately assess for the enrollment trends and needs of our population. In addition to teaching staff to achieve optimal class sizes, we are advocating for additional behavioral interventionists, counselors, social workers, and administrators. The level of overcrowding creates potential safety concerns during arrival and dismissal in navigating the hallways and relocatable classrooms outside the school and in providing adequate restroom or cafeteria capacity. By way of example, our lunch schedule begins at 10.30 a.m., meaning some students, like my son, are having lunch only two hours after being provided breakfast in school. Based on a 2014 facilities assessment, our building's core space is undersized for its state-rated capacity. Furthermore, a 2008 school system report to assess elementary school overcrowding in Towson indicates that while there are some topographical challenges and traffic flow considerations, our building and property are largely favorable for renovation and expansion. We are keenly aware that the needs of Pleasant Plains are not unlike those of other county schools. In fact, many of our neighboring schools are experiencing similar overcrowding issues. While none of us would argue that a broader assessment of school capacity in the central area shouldn't be part of the strategy, we strongly believe that serious and timely consideration for renovation and expansion of Pleasant Plains is needed to sustain our students and staff while benefiting the community at large. Thank you for your consideration. Thank you. And next we have Brenda Pfeiffer. Good evening. Good evening. Um, I have with me tonight a copy of the article that recently appeared in the Baltimore Sun about the STAT program. Um, I imagine that many of you have seen it and you know that the news is not good. After four years and hundreds of millions of dollars, the STAT program has not created positive change in achievement for our students. And despite claims to the contrary now, we were told at the outset that increased student achievement was one of the goals of STAT. These results do not come as a surprise to me or to many other stakeholders who have been questioning this program from the start. After seeking answers from BCPS and receiving none, I did my own research and I learned that there was no evidence that such a program would have a positive outcome for students, yet BCPS moved forward with it anyway, and implementation was not done slowly looking for results before expanding, rather it's been continued, a continued rollout while disregarding any evidence to the contrary. Tonight, I am asking this board to do what should have been done from the start. Insist on data and evidence proving the value of STAT or insist on moving BCPS in a better direction. As you seek this evidence, please don't be fooled by presentations and overviews that claim that Lighthouse schools are outperforming other schools. This misleading claim uses average scores for all Lighthouse schools. Looking at individual Lighthouse school scores tells a very different story. In fact, I've looked at those scores myself and seen that Lighthouse schools are not really outperforming others. So I encourage you to do your homework and look at the data for yourself. 
Also, don't get sidetracked by buzzwords like equity and engagement. While these sound good, STAT cannot truly provide either of these. Equity doesn't come from giving every student the same thing, the same device and the same curriculum designed to use that device. It comes from providing for the various needs of students, nutrition, needed special education, counseling, mentoring, and behavior help, for example, to level the playing field for all students. And engagement is something that is subjective and only measured through observation, but can easily be misinterpreted. Finally, please create opportunities for genuine, honest feedback from all stakeholders, students, teachers, and parents, not just from carefully selected focus groups whose feedback doesn't tell the whole story. There have been so many concerns beyond the lack of improved achievement over the few, past few years. Problems with connectivity, malfunctioning devices, both the old ones and the new ones. Students breaking through firewalls or using devices inappropriately. Health and developmental concerns, data mining, the list goes on. I urge you to take a fresh look at STAT from top to bottom and demand real answers about the quality and effectiveness of the program. With the answers you find, all future decisions about STAT can be based on the reality of what STAT does and does not offer our students and teachers. And I believe these answers will prove that we can find better, smarter, and more responsible ways to provide technology. Thank you. And our next speaker is Deborah Brewer. Good evening. Good evening. <clears throat> Good evening, members of the board. My name is Deborah Brewer, and I am a parent from Pleasant Plains Elementary School. I am here on behalf of the students, parents, and teachers at our school. My purpose for being here tonight is to ask for the board's increased attention to the overcrowding of our school. Pleasant Plains Elementary School is located in the Towson area and a steady increase in the number of students over the last 10 years has brought us to the present situation with an enrollment that is 138% over its state rated capacity. Our school now has over 700 children, which is about 60 more than originally projected for this year. That's almost three extra classrooms of children. In the fiscal year 2019 proposed budget, we are projected to have an enrollment of 640 despite our current size and the data that shows an increasing enrollment trend. Since 74% of our classes are already larger than the standard class size used for staffing allocation in the budget, an inaccurate enrollment projection will set our students up for more overcrowded classes next year. We ask the board to consider the process used to determine projected enrollment and adjust it accordingly for accuracy. This will give us a more adequate number of classroom teachers to serve our student population. Of additional concern is the fact that elementary schools with over 700 students are supposed to be allocated two assistant principals and three clerical staff, but our projected enrollment was too low to receive this allocation. We would like staffing allocations to be responsive not only to fluctuating enrollment numbers, but also to the needs of each individual school. As the third largest Title I school in the county, we should have a third individual join our amazing administrative team and a third individual join our hardworking front office staff. The other staff who support our children, such as behavior interventionists, psychologists, social workers, counselors, paraeducators, and resource teachers are equally important. We don't believe that there should be a one-size-fits-all formula for allocating much-needed human resources to our schools. We ask that additional student support staff and educators be placed at Pleasant Plains immediately so that our children do not have to wait another year to get the ratio of support they deserve. We thank you for your partnership in addressing the overcrowding at Pleasant Plains Elementary School. Thank you. Our next speaker is Sarah Gonzalez. Good, Good evening. evening, members of the board. 
Uh, my name is Sarah Boatman. Sorry, recently got married. <laughs> Gonzalez. Um, I have a seven-year-old second grader at Pleasant Plains Elementary. Um, as you guys have heard, we have a huge overcrowding issue at our school. So, um, here to ask the board to address the overcrowding. Pleasant Plains Elementary was built in 1958. Small expansion <coughs> added in 1974. Um, current state rate of capacity is 509 students. As of last week, there were over 700 students enrolled in our school. A simple analysis of the steady increase in enrollment over the last 10 years versus the projections for the next five years shows the incompatibility of BCPS's projections and the situation in our school. Although we know that overcrowding is not an issue unique to Pleasant Plains, as the third largest Title I school in Baltimore County, feel that waiting too long to address it will be incredibly detrimental to our students' experiences. We appreciate the daily efforts and willingness of our school staff to go the extra mile for our children. Unfortunately, even the most dedicated teachers are eventually overwhelmed and exhausted by the behavior <coughs> problems, logistical issues, and increased workload associated with an overcrowded school. Um, some of those you've also heard this evening. For that reason, we ask that the Board of Education look more closely at the way school enrollment projections are made and make appropriate adjustments before staffing is determined for the following year. In the long term, we would like a forward-thinking solution to address the size of the building and the number of students at houses. Our students shouldn't have to eat their lunch two hours after eating breakfast because of the size of the cafeteria. Young children shouldn't have to worry about getting separated from their class jostled around in the hallways and the lobby as hundreds of students move between their special area classes and lunch. Ordinary bathroom maintenance and repairs should not cause a logistical crisis because of the 23 to 1 ratio of students to toilets. In 2008, Pleasant Plains Elementary was part of an assessment of the overcrowding of Towson area elementary schools and it was determined to be the most favorable building for renovation or expansion. That was 10 years ago. Over 200 students later, nothing has been done for the school. Please do not make our children wait any longer. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Our next speaker is Mr. Jason Garber. Good evening. Good evening, Madam Chairperson. Good evening, uh, Madam Vice Chair, Superintendent White, and members of the board. First, congratulations on your election and appointment, and looking forward to uh, your service for the next four years. Thank you. Um, okay, my name is Jason Garber. I, too, have a first grader over Pleasant Plains. Now, just by way of historical context, I was like four or five years ago, still trying to fight for things of extra resources, extra commitments from the board um, and from BCPS to help Pleasant Plains because the problem was obvious four to five years ago where we would be today. And that was long before I had a child in the school. I've now witnessed these things firsthand. There are numerous issues. This is a school that has a, obviously it's Title I, but it has sizable English, um, has a sizable uh, population where English is not the primary language. It has uh, a number of problems uh, with behavior. It has a sizable homeless population. These are all matters that are known, of course, to the system, but yet they're not extra commitments to help Pleasant Plains deal with some of the issues that are attendant with those circumstances. And now that the school is overcrowded at 700, which again is well understood um, from five years ago that we would be in this projection, even if not exact, here we are sitting here today still with no solution and, and these problems, and now it's getting worse and worse and worse. So we should not have to scratch and claw and fight for try, to try to get relief. We should not have to scratch and claw and fight to try to get more resources and staffing for people, uh, for the staff of the school to help them, but also to help all the students at the school who have those problems and those that have to sit here and watch those problems unfold in classrooms, distracting them from their own work. We should not have to come here repeatedly to try to get these um, 
I guess, uh, matters resolved, but we need everyone's help here. This isn't something we can simply just redistrict away because we need as many people as we possibly can for parental involvement uh, at the school. We need help, we need your help, and we need a commitment from everybody to try to work for a better solution to get to a better uh, outcome for all the children and all the staff at the school. Remember, this is not just the, the students. You heard today from a teacher at the school about the burnout experienced. Now imagine if you are, uh, anecdotally, my daughter gets a class uh, list from before she was in kindergarten with 21 students in August. Two weeks later, there's a new one with 24 students. She shows up to class who's now 27 or 28. Two weeks after that, she's now with 30, and they have to now create a new kindergarten class when these kindergarten teachers are now watching 30 plus students from time to time until we have to scratch, claw, and fight to get another one. That should not happen uh, at Pleasant Plains, nor should it happen anywhere in Baltimore County. I hope that we can get your commitment to work with us to get a better solution going forward. Thank you. Thank you. And next we have Brian Riddle. Good evening. Good evening. My name is Dr. Ryan Riddle, and I'm the a proud parent of two uh, students at Pleasant Plains Elementary. And I also happen to be the president of the Pleasant Plains Parent Teacher Association. My friends and neighbors have already discussed the overcrowding at our school as it's reached 138% of its state rated capacity and many of the class sizes have now exceed 30 students. So I'll, I'll keep my remarks very short. Our group has already reached out to and looks forward to working with our community superintendent's office to find a short term solution that helps our teachers educate the more than 700 students enrolled at our school. We understand that they have a plan in the works and we look forward to hearing from it. We hope that this board will can consider a much needed expansion of Pleasant Plains. I will, as my colleagues have already talked about, the 2008 uh, report indicated that our school was the easiest to renovate. We hope that the board will consider a more long-term solution to address this problem instead of just placing a new portal classroom at our school. We already have five. We'd like to avoid having six. Thank you. Thank you, and our final speaker of the evening is Ms. Diana Bergman. Good evening. Good evening. Hopefully you brought enough to share this time. So good evening, and I brought my magic show back, and it's actually not for you guys. Um, from the last meeting, I had a group of parents and students that reached out and asked me to redo the magic trick. So. That's what I'm going to do today. I'm doing this for all our BCPS kids so they could see. Um, at the Board of Ed meetings could be exciting. So we have marshmallows. They're little squash. Sorry, I kind of sat on them. And everybody wants to get access to the same amount resources for their education. Nobody just wants to get one marshmallow. Come on. Everybody wants to. And, um, you know, the kids really learn different throughout our system. Not all our children in BCPS do the traditional schoolhouse education experience. We have children that learn differently and they need resources and those resources that are needed as that population increases um, comes in different ways from social workers and counselors and behavior health and interventions um, for children that um, are having their own challenges. They still all have the right to receive two marshmallows, okay? So everybody, you know, should get two marshmallows. Um, when it comes to education, everybody, doesn't matter what part of the pocket of the Baltimore County they are. Um, I just listened to the parents that came and advocate today for um, Pleasant Plains Elementary, and I heard that they hit that 700 mark. You know, Baltimore Highlands a few school years ago, that's an elementary school in my community, that hit the 700 mark. And we had additional assistant principals that were added to the staff, two ESOL teachers, 
um, two counselors. Um, we ended up eventually getting a full-time social worker to help our population because our kids needed that. So I would like to this board to help and BCPS to help that com school community to get the two marshmallows just like we did at Baltimore Highlands. So don't forget, the kids are watching the live stream now. So that means everybody has to be in their best behavior, you know? Because um, they're really looking up to you, especially our student board members. So congratulations. You represent the best part of BCPS, our students. Thank you. <laughs> Moving on to item F, new business, personnel matters. Can I call on Dr. Mayo to present the personnel matters, please? Good evening, Chairwoman Causey. Vice Chairwoman Hen, Superintendent White, members of the board. I'd like board consent for the following personnel matters, retirements and resignations. Do I have a motion to approve the personnel matters as presented in exhibits F1 and F2? <coughs> so moved. Do I have a second? Second. Thank you. Any discussion? All in favor, please raise your hand. Any opposed? The motion carries. Thank you, Dr. Mayo. Thank you. Next item of business is administrative appointments. Ms. White, please present administrative appointments. Thank you. Members of the board, I would like to bring forward for your approval the following administrative appointment. Principal, Summit Park Elementary School. Do I have a motion to approve the administrative appointments as presented in Exhibit G1? Do I have a second? Any discussion? All in favor, please raise your hand. Any opposed? The motion carries. Thank you. Ms. Ms. White. Yes, thank you. I'd like to ask Ms. Sheila Thomas to please stand to be recognized. Congratulations on your appointment. Thomas is the new principal of Summit Park Elementary School. Do you have any friends or family here with you tonight? Congratulations. Thank you. Our next item of business is action taken in closed session. If I could have Mr. Nussbaum. Good evening. Earlier this evening, the board considered three appeals regarding confidential employee and student matters in your quasi-judicial capacity. These three matters were considered on the record as there were no requests for oral arguments made. At this time, it would be appropriate to confirm the actions taken in closed session in those matters, and they were hearing examiner numbers 18-41, 18 18-59, and 19-28. Thank you. Do I have a motion to approve the action taken in closed session? Thank you, Mr. Offerman. Do I have a second? second. Thank you, Ms. Rowe. Is there any discussion? All in favor, please raise your hand. Are there any opposed? The motion carries. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. The orders are on the desk for signatures later this evening. Thank you. Next, we have item I, new business contracts. If I could ask um, Mr. Saris and Mr. Dixit to please come forward. Members of the board, the board's Biz building and contracts committee met earlier this <coughs> evening. <coughs> Items I-1 through I-8 are being forwarded to the full board. Thank you. Actually, items I-1 through I-6, as well as I-8, are being forwarded to the full board for approval. Item 7 is being forwarded to the full board for discussion and vote. Do I have a motion to approve items I-1 through I-6 and I-8? Thank you. No second is needed since the recommendation comes from the committee. Is there any discussion on these items? All in favor, please raise your hand. Any opposed? The motion carries. Ms. Hen? Thank you. I'd ask Mr. Saris to present I-7. Yes, uh, this item, JMI 60419, Mathematics Program Review, 
This is a new competitively bid contract to provide a systematic audit of the mathematics program. Approval is requested for a three-year, six-month contract with one recommended bidder and contract spending authority of $550,000 over the three and a half year term. Ms. Hen. Thank you, and board members submitted several questions in advance. If you could please review those questions and responses. Absolutely. Good evening, everyone. Good evening. We received a number, um, a total of about 13 questions, so we actually, um, as a team, will work together to provide responses to the board. The first question asks about the process that is used to select the awarded bidder. And I know that Mr. Saris, as part of the purchasing um, department, has specifics regarding that. I can certainly add to it. But Mr. Saris, at this time, would you provide a response? Uh, certainly. So um, we followed the uh, guidelines outlined in board policy in Rule 3210, which requires us to advertise uh, publicly and engage in a review of the qualified bids that meet the established criteria. Um, a preliminary evaluation is conducted by the purchasing agent managing the process. Um, they review uh, the proposals, uh, in this case, uh, which were uh, four, uh, that were, re uh, excuse me, three received in response to the bid. Um, the evaluation confirms that uh, the uh, firms have complied with the process and the documents required, that they're eligible to do business in the state of Maryland, and they've not been debarred by any federal, state, or local government. Uh, during this process, one firm was uh, disqualified. So I, I think to stand corrected, we received four, we disqualified one, evaluated three. Uh, a team of five uh, subject matter experts from our staff uh, reviewed and scored the proposals. Um, evaluations cover review of the solution proposed by the firm uh, as outlined in the solicitation, a review of the experience and qualifications of the firms, uh, a review of the qualifications of the staff uh, who, the, who the proposals have uh, indicated as principals. Uh, these scores are then uh, totaled and compiled by the Office of Purchasing. A best and final offer is then requested from uh, the highest scoring proposal, and that is the, f the, uh, the highest scoring firm is being recommended uh, as the award bidder this evening. And I'll just add that this, uh, is, uh, this process for a request for proposal evaluation is essentially the same for every RFP uh, that is issued. Question number two asks, what specific insight do we expect this audit to provide? The four areas of focus for this particular audit are in the area of one curriculum alignment that really focuses on the level of alignment of our math curriculum to the Maryland College and Career Readiness Standard. It also focuses on analyzing the curriculum to determine the level of focus, the level of coherence, as well as rigor. It focuses on the, appropriate, the appropriateness of pacing to ensure that the units of study that have been identified, there's appropriate pacing throughout not only the instructional day, but also the instructional year to cover the content. The second area focuses on course sequence and academic pathways, which really provides a review of middle school and high school courses, the sequence to summarize how many students progress through the sequence that has been identified. It also looks at various measures of success. The third area, area focuses on curricular implementation, which is the written and also the taught curriculum. We, the, the, the focus of the study would be to take a look at whether it's implemented, it's being implemented the way it was designed, 
examining uses of teacher practices, student engagement, and also how that varies across the system. The fourth area would be looking at professional learning needs, which really helps to determine if teachers and administrators are receiving the professional development that's needed to support a strong implementation of the curriculum. The third question will be addressed by Ms. Shea. Good evening. Question number three asked, is classroom climate or any other factors to be considered? Suppose, for instance, the curriculum is just fine. How did we come to the conclusion as a school system that the curriculum is the problem and not some other contributing factor? Um, so in that instance, the curriculum was just fine. That would be fine by me. Um, we did not assume that the curriculum is the problem, but rather we're trying to ensure that we have a solid curriculum. In BCPS, we have a strong tradition of curriculum written by our teachers for our teachers. And so because math is a priority as identified by our superintendent, everything is on the table. So to this question, yes, there are a number of factors that would impact math achievement for our students. We are beginning with the curriculum because we know as a system that's a critical foundation. We need to provide our teachers and our students with a curriculum that is rigorous and relevant and aligned to standards. So we're starting there, but we're certainly not assuming that that is the sole factor. Um, but as you heard from Dr. Wheatley Phillip, it is somewhat of a rollout plan. So we will get to a place of looking at implementation, which will help us to see other variables that may be impacting, but it's important that we know first that the curriculum is aligned because we don't want to focus on implementation of a curriculum that we know we have to make revisions to. So that's why we have that sequence. Um, we certainly are also looking for what other information can we gather from this audit to help us support our teachers. So it is um, certainly true, as this question implies, that there are multiple factors that could and probably will be contributing to our math achievement. We're simply starting with curriculum because we know that's a foundation to ensuring all of our students have access and opportunity to the rigorous standards that they're expected to master. Question number four asks, how quickly do we expect to have usable data that can be implemented to improve our math outcomes? When we first gathered together as a team, we brought together um, experts from the area of academics, er, experts from the area of research and strategic planning, as well as other members of CNI. And as we sat and we talked about how do we support and make sure that as we look at um, the area of math, we're asking the right questions, we really focus on an intentionality in terms of developing different phases of this audit. So when we look, as Ms. Shea shared, in terms of the alignment pieces, alignment comes first, and after that, then we focus on the sequencing pieces and the pathways. We focus on implementation and professional learning. Each phase of this study connects with the other, and so there are specific junctures and timely updates that will be given to the board in a timely manner. If I can add to that too, the, um, as we mentioned, the first b phase being the curriculum alignment, our intention, depending on the outcome of the contract, is that we would have results from that first part about alignment in time to use the summer curriculum workshops that we have in planned for this summer to be able to start making any revisions that come as a result of that. So our intention is to move quickly on that first part and not wait for the duration to be able to start making adjustments or to address any concerns that may be raised with alignment. Question number five asks, what specific areas will this math audit focus on? The audit will focus on the four areas that we previously discussed. Question number six asks, will it tell us if problems exist only at particular schools, or will it focus on generalizations across the whole of the school system? The goal for this particular review is to really collect a representation of a set of schools. So we're looking at collecting data across the entire system, a representative group. The audit will focus on system-wide changes that are needed. There are key questions that will be asked regarding the written and the taught curriculum. It will look at the professional development that is needed to support our teachers. And if, it's not, if we don't see um, specific benchmarks identified as a result of the review, then we have to ask what are the implications for teaching and learning. Individual goals for schools are addressed through a process at the school level, and that is through the school progress planning process. That provides information to students and staff in terms of next steps at the school level. And if I can add to that as well, while we won't be focusing on specific schools individually, and as Dr. Whitley Phillips said, we will be looking at representative samples, it will hopefully give us information by level so that we can um, start to focus too between elementary, middle, and high school, what might be the additional supports, either from a curriculum or a professional learning need, um, that we need to be able to respond to as well. 
Question number seven asks, has John Hopkins completed such an audit for other districts? Which ones? And what, when we did our research, we looked in the area of Maryland, we found that there were two of the districts in which John Hopkins provided a curriculum audit as well. One is in Baltimore City Public Schools in the spring of 2008. They had a contract that lasted for one year. Data collected over six months. For that one year of study, the focus was on number one and number three, which is the curriculum and the implementation phases of our particular audit. The cost was around $160,000. So if we were to do some mathematics, if they focused on two phases, that would be $80,000 per phase, times the four phases, that would be roughly $320,000 a year. If you multiplied that over three years, which is the same term of our study, that would be about $960,000. The second school system is Montgomery, Montgomery County Public Schools. In spring of 2008, they also had an audit in the focus areas, math as well as ELA. The evaluation contract lasts for two years, with data collection activities primarily occurring over a span of eight months. The cost of their project was $450,000. There are also studies in the area of Fairfax, Syracuse, um, New York, Rochester, New York, Wayne County, North Carolina, Los Angeles, United, 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 sorry, Los Angeles Unified School District, San Diego Unified School District as well. Question number eight asks what were the outcomes and to provide links. The outcomes are listed in an executive summary for the two school systems in which we um, researched, Baltimore City as well as, Balt as well as Montgomery County Public Schools, and we can provide links to that in a weekly update. Question number nine asks, what is the schedule for completion of deliverables? The schedule will be developed once we have a contract that's approved. Specific dates and multiple reports, timely updates will be provided to the board once we have a contract that's been approved. Question number 11 asks for, um, to provide a detailed breakdown of deliverable dates. Based on the information shared with us, for item number one, which is curriculum alignment, the time frame is January to June of 2019. Item number two, course sequence and academic pathways, that runs from March until June of 2019. Item number three, curriculum implementation, runs from February of 2019 to, to July, September of 2020. And number four, professional learning needs, um, that also runs the same time span from, let's see, from March until July of 2020. So most of the time is spent at number three, which is looking at curriculum implementation as well as professional learning. That part involves um, classroom visits, working with focus groups, looking at how resources are being utilized as well as conducting surveys. Question number 12 asks, what is JHU's role in implementation of the curriculum year one and three? Is this implementing the revised curriculum? Provide more information. Throughout this particular audit, the role of JHU is not to specifically um, create curriculum. The role is to serve as an independent evaluator. So that means that JHU and the staff will use the lens focused around the four phases that we identified. Their role will be to record, collect data, and report the findings to members of the board as well as BCPS staff. Question number 13, the last one. Why was JHU selected over other responsible bidders? One of the things that was really important for us is to make sure that we were following Rule 3210 to make sure that the process follows all of the guidelines outlined in rule, as well as to make sure that the process was fair and the process was transparent. JHU emerged as the most responsible and responsive bid. Any additional questions? Ms. Mack and then Ms. Pestur. Thank you very much for that information. I believe I heard you speak at one point about measures of success as one of the benchmarks. Who will be establishing those measures of success? Part of the process that JHU will enroll, will engage in before even beginning the audit is to really work with the, a set of reviewers. The reviewers will actually engage in what we describe as innovator reliability, and that makes sure that as they are reviewing the curriculum, as they are looking at the implementation of it, they are calibrating to make sure that they are 
in lockstep so that they're reviewing the same information in the same manner. The measures of success that they will identify will be based on each of the four phases that have been identified to make sure that there is alignment with those four areas that have been identified and there's consistency among the folks that are engaging in the process. And I have a second question. Will the efficacy of the curriculum be assessed with and without devices? So the curriculum does not rely solely on devices, so depending on what part of the curriculum that they will um, be observing in the implementation, they will, see, they will see portions of the curriculum that use the devices and they will see instruction that does not. Thank you. Sure. some more support from you in, in responding to this because obviously I've not seen the entire contract. So I need to look at what we got um, in our board documents. Mm -hmm. I need to hear what it is that Hopkins or anyone else for that matter will look at prior to the analysis. Obviously you have to have some sort of data I've heard that used um, before from other speakers. You have to have some data to undergird anything that they're going to analyze. Otherwise, we come out with deliverables that are not necessarily in line with what our needs are. One of the early questions had to do with um, uh, how you work or how they are going to actually do this study. So I need to hear whether you are, how they are embracing teachers and children's work, whether we are looking at benchmarks, I did hear the word benchmark, whether we're looking at benchmarks, are we looking at formative and summative assessment? What are we looking at specifically so we know where the children are prior to the analysis? That being said, once the analysis has been done and all of this information comes back to us, what are we going to do with it in terms of differentiating, paying attention to what is happening possibly from one school to another school? So if we're looking at a recommendation, because I'm, one of the questions had to do with I don't think they use the word differentiation, but I'm going to use that. And, and the answer had to do with system-wide. But we know from what we already have that system-wide is not working. So I want to know how we will make a decision about, or are we, about whether some schools or areas maybe are going to have uh, the curriculum shifted, whether there will be a change in the pattern, or whether some will stay the same or others will change. I know what the focus is that Mrs. White has for our focus, and for all our people, for our people. Our people for our okay. people. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, I want our people, and what someone said that in the question, that uh, we don't necessarily want it to be equal, we want it to be equitable based on where our young people are. But I want you to please go back and tell us how they're going to start because a visit survey will not always tell us. We know that from history, what we need to know. We need to see what the children are doing. And can, can I start this one and then maybe? Okay. <laughs> so the, there's one thing that I want to note is that the audit is just one part of our system's overarching plan around math. Our superintendent has charged us in curriculum and instruction along with our colleagues in school support team um, to look at math in many different ways. The curriculum audit is just one piece. And so part of what you're talking about is going to come out of this in that we need to start with evaluating the curriculum first from alignment to the standards. So in that first step, what the evaluators will be looking at are what 
what are the expectations of the Maryland College and Career Ready Standards for Math. And to do that, they'll also have to look at how are those measured, because we know we have student achievement data that shows us that we are not meeting the mark in mathematics in many grade levels for many different populations, which is not to say some of our students aren't being tremendously successful, but we know we have work to do. But the first step is, does our curriculum provide opportunity and access for our students to meet those high demands as outlined by the standards? If the answer to that is no, there's somewhat of a do not pass go, do not collect $200 in that we have to take a look at that curriculum and make revisions to ensure that it is meeting that standard of rigor. Part of that standard for a curriculum is also about relevance. And so when we talk about some of our students not having equal opportunity and access, our curriculum may be working for some students and not for others. And that has to be a part of that evaluation so that we can ensure revisions are not only aligned to rigor, but also ensuring relevance. In terms of what we were talking about for implementation, the first step is to understand if teachers are not, and I'm going to use air quotes, following the curriculum, that will come out as part of that next phase in looking at implementation. But what we then have to do, to your point, is understand why not. Why aren't we implementing the curriculum as written? If we know that we have this independent evaluator saying it is aligned to the rigor of the standards and does have opportunity and access for students to be successful, we then need to find out what are the barriers preventing teachers from implementing the curriculum? Is it because there aren't resources to support differentiation? Is it because they need additional support in the classrooms or additional professional learning? So that is the second piece of the puzzle that we're hoping to understand from the implementation phase of the audit. But that has to start with us being able to build confidence in our teachers that if they did follow our curriculum, they would in fact be meeting the demands of the standards that their students are gonna be held accountable to. And that's why that is a phase out program for implementation. Our hope was then if we had a curriculum that was rigorous and relevant and we were able to see implementation of a curriculum, of course our ultimate goal is for student achievement and for our students to be successful at meeting those standards. And so all of the pieces that you mentioned, um, yes, we're going to be looking at a representative sample, but it's not the only piece of the puzzle. Our school support team, our executive directors, and our principals are doing regular learning walks and visiting classrooms to support mathematics in a multitude of ways. Um, we're working with parent universities, support parents. We're right now about to develop videos to support parents in understanding mathematical literacy and how to support their children. So this audit is just one piece of what you're describing is a larger approach um, that a superintendent has charged us with to address the priority of math. Specifically to the question that you asked regarding the pre-work that takes place, that has been identified in terms of being accomplished in six different phases. The first phase, phase would be to understand the priorities and identify key questions. On JHU's part, that would be identifying central research questions, prioritizing grades, units, and elements of the curriculum to review, developing a project timeline. Phase two involves train and norm reviewers as we share to have that reliability among different reviewers that are working. Phase three talks about curriculum alignment analysis, in which they're carefully reviewing the selected curriculum, working in pairs to ensure consistency and ensure understanding of the curriculum. Phase five talks about a roll-up and analysis of the finding. The action is to conduct analysis, as well as conduct quality reviews of the analysis. Phase six talks about share findings and recommendations, and to be able to deliver a final report and a presentation. So those are the phases that were outlined as part of this particular bid. Ms. Rowe. So thank you for answering multitudes of questions. Um, I have two additional questions. So presumably we're doing an audit of the math system because some problem has been identified with math. And as a new board, I, I don't really know exactly what went into identifying this problem, the scope of the problem. Like if this is a proposed solution, we need to know and understand as much as we can about the problem that is leading up to the proposed solution in order to understand if this is actually the solution to the problem. And then my other question is, don't laugh at me. Why don't we just ask the teachers? Wouldn't that save a lot of money? 
I mean, can't we just ask math teachers? Miss Falaco could tell us. You ask her. I bet she could. Like, why don't we just go ask the math teachers? Don't they know the curriculum? They know if they're following it. They know why. And, and we do talk to teachers. So I want to go back to your first question. So the, the first problem is math achievement. When you look at our math achievement scores, um, we are not performing where we want to as a district. We know that we are fourth from the bottom. Um, this board, actually the previously board, has reviewed some of that data that was shared with the state board in terms of our achievement on park. Um, we know that scores in some grade levels are declining, and so we know that we have an obligation to change that and disrupt that. We want to increase, increase opportunities for students, and we want our math achievement to go up because we want all of our students to be successful. So that's the first problem problem that was identified in broad terms. We then have an obligation to understand there's lots of different components into understanding why our math achievement is not where we want it to be. One of those begins with curriculum, which is part of what this audit helps us to undertake. In terms of asking teachers, we do talk to teachers a lot. And we do hear from teachers a variety of um, responses. Some teachers do say things like, it's not aligned. But when we say terms like it's not aligned, some of that belies an understanding of the depth of the standards and what are the expectations in terms of focus, coherence, and rigor. And so alignment means more than just I see this problem in the curriculum and the exact same problem with just two different numbers shows up on the assessment. We have to look at alignment to the standards. And so when we talk to teachers, sometimes they talk about trying to make decisions within the curriculum about how to implement the curriculum for diverse students. We have one curriculum that we are purporting to try to serve the needs with 175 school centers and programs. And so part of what we have to do with implementation is understand how is our curriculum helping to support our teachers in making those decisions to teach to the eyes of the students in front of them. Um, so certainly part of the larger math plan, we do meet with administrators and teachers and department chairs to have ongoing conversations in professional learning communities about what are they seeing in math classrooms, what do they need. So while that's not identified as part of the audit, it is absolutely a part of our larger math plan that we have in the system. And I'll just jump in there also to say that, first of all, I I'm so proud of the team for really kind of taking this on and to uh, engage and to answer uh, the questions so thoroughly and uh, comprehensively. I called for this audit um, for a reason. When you take a look at the, the, the trends in terms of math trends, and it's, it's just as Ms. Shea just described and Dr. Wheatley Phillip as well, when you take a look at our trends, we know that as, as superintendent, it's my job to, to look at the structure and to look at the organizational structure and to look at structurally if we have any gaps or any missing pieces. If we can't answer those questions by only just asking teachers and through our observation, then we need another viewpoint in terms of uh, the, our life's blood, and that is the curriculum, and that's how we operate. So the alignment to standards, the alignment to those eight mathematical practices, the alignment when it comes to literacy, we know that every assessment, I don't care if you're talking about the kindergarten readiness assessment or the PSAT, SAT, any assessment you're talking about is a literacy assessment. So again, it's alignment with our content, it's alignment to standards, and I called for this audit to see if there's structurally, if there are gaps in the structure that we need to address. Um, certainly, the team has taken on the entire long-range um, plan that is in place to say, well, what, what's actually happening, short-term and long-range plan that will address curriculum, address instruction, address how the assessments are then aligned, the embedded assessments are aligned to the standards as well, thinking about the professional development, understanding how we budget, how we staff, um, and then again, the implementation overall. So, uh, you know, again, this will help us to address some of the still lingering questions that we have out there structurally for you as a board to make sure that we are aligning our resources to our need. And so for that, we're asking that we have the opportunity to engage an external auditor so that we can see exactly where our gaps are structurally. Um, we haven't made any bones about where, where we are weak. We expose that, we expose our sore spots so that we can get better. Um, and so we are open to having those honest conversations. In, the, in last uh, summer, I, you know, in terms of being forward thinking, 
we had to set up a support structure as, as well to make sure that we had a support structure for mentoring and for coaching around the academics and to address our needs when it came to school climate which was the whole purpose of the change in the organizational structure. This is just another piece of the plan to help us to identify where those gaps are so that we can align our support and our resources to those gaps. Mr. Kuhn. Um, I want to follow up with something that, um, that Mrs. Um, Mack said. When uh, Johns Hopkins comes in and they look at your curriculum, mm -hmm. um, how are they going to ascertain the value or are they going to ascertain the value of um, extra curriculum that you've made available via uh, the STAT program or computer programs that are out there for different groups? Are you asking specifically about if they're going to evaluate individual programs that we might be using? They're going to be focusing on the curriculum that we write, that we have written, um, <clears throat> at, that we hire teachers to write, um, including the lesson plans, the unit essential questions and enduring understandings, and then the assessments that we have developed as a school system. That makes perfect sense, but at the same time, because I have I have kids going through all of this and I'm very focused on math. Um, I've, I've seen a push to your homework is to go do Dreambox, right? So if you're telling me that they're only gonna focus on the curriculum as you're written, as they're tested, then you are missing a piece of what's going on. It, it's, it's going on because teachers are directed to get kids on the computer to use the supplemental curriculum. So I'm concerned that that's a blind spot. So what I will tell you is I do believe that piece would come up in implementation in terms of what they're observing about how instructional time is being used in the classroom. And as I said, the evaluation of different programs or different materials, supplemental, such as Dreambox you mentioned, is a part of our larger um, plan within the system. It's just not a part of the focus of what Johns Hopkins will look like in that first phase when they are looking at the curriculum alignment as written. So I'm, I'm not going to let go of this. Sure. Um, the observation of what they're doing in the class uh, could vary. Um, and also, I've been told, and I've seen it happen, where they're like, oh, do 15 minutes on Dreambox every night. Mm -hmm. Because that's how that program works. They just want them to get log time in and guide them through and gamify or whatever they do with it. So again, um, I think it needs to be called out in what you're doing, or you're going to miss something, and we're going to waste time and effort because we don't have time for that. Understood. Is there anyone that has not yet? Uh, Ms. Adekoya. Um, I first wanted to answer to Ms. Rowe's question about the just asking teachers. When I look at it, it's like there's plenty of factors that affect grasping and understanding mathematics in general. And if you're telling if you're saying just to ask teachers, as a student who sits and is instructed, it's already hard for me if um, the instruction and the way that my teacher is teaching it, or just the whole idea of how my teacher teaches and how I will grasp it compared to another student. So just asking teachers really will eventually remove from substantial data and help that can help the betterment of mathematics in general. So I guess my question is more for clarification and more understanding as much as the audit is it as long as as much as it's um for judging the curriculum will there be information um pulled out of it for how to better enhance instruction and its effectiveness as well as how to then affect professional development for math teachers because that is very essential and i think that is number one in me understanding and other students 114,000 students understanding math Thank you for the question. The expectation is that they will provide us with reports and updates based on the findings in addition to recommendations in terms of these four areas that have been identified. One of which is professional learning. So the point that you made is a part of that. Thank you. Thank you so much for coming. I mean, math is so important. I think it's wonderful. Um, to hear about this. Um, I just wanted to know along the lines of it being an audit if there was going to be sort of like um, 
uh, audit and diversity of learning as far as different learning styles um, and different ways that students and children process math, the differences in uh, race, cultural, gender, um, language differences, and if that was going to be taken into account, then also as far as how many girls were maybe going into math, excelling in math, I know that's an area, um, just sort of kind of breaking that down, maybe those who steered away from it, are they going towards it? How are we encouraging mm -hmm. more girls to take on math and STEM and, and, and things like that? And, and just doing an overall assessment. Um, and I know what I have is brief, so I just wanted to hear, see if I could hear more <laughs> about that and how perhaps that would be incorporated. What they've identified in item three, which is curriculum implementation, is really focusing on very specific evaluation questions. And those evaluation questions cover the span of some what you mentioned in terms of teacher practice, looking at student engagement, looking at um, specific grade levels, looking at characteristics of schools, also looking at student characteristics, students that are English language learners, students receiving special education services, as well as the number of students that are economically disadvantaged. So the curriculum implementation part in which they're working in the classroom, they're observing, they're also engaging in get, getting feedback, will be inclusive to support those areas as well. So I think another piece that might address that is in phase two, when we're looking at course sequence and academic pathways, they will be helping us to analyze who is benefiting from opportunity and access. And so some of that data will capture which students along very um, a lot of different ways that we sort students to see who is actually um, accessing higher levels of math, for example, or which sequences are actually helping students to um, have that opportunity and access to be able to achieve. So I think that area of the audit may give you some of the information that you're describing in terms of gender differences, by race, et cetera. Sure. Ms. Hen. Thank you. Um, and thank you for taking the time to answer all of our questions. Of I know course. it's a lot, and it's sure. getting late in the evening, so I appreciate it. Um, so we're not the first, nor will we be the last, to tackle math achievement and achievement for our students overall. And there's tremendous value in learning from those who have come before. Absolutely. Um, you mentioned tonight the two um, audits by Baltimore City Schools in Montgomery County, which were actually taken 10 years ago in 2008 already. So I imagine they've learned a lot and have seen the outcomes of their investment in performing such an audit. So while we haven't received those reports as a board, I'm wondering if you might be prepared to summarize what they learned from taking this on, because of course we want to ensure maximum value of our investment in this for our students and you know, sharing what they've learned in the process. Well, first I'd like to share that the two audits for Baltimore City as well as Montgomery County were completed in spring of 2018, which is this current school year. And at this time, we have not as a team um, spent some time in terms of reviewing their information because we're really focused around Team BCPS and how we can work here to really support our students. We do have a link that we can provide you with that provides an executive summary based on um, John Hopkins' findings as a result of engaging in those two audits with those school systems. So we certainly can provide that, but in clear transparency, we have not um, had the opportunity with a quick turnaround in terms of when the questions were presented to be able to take a look at the findings and also to summarize um, the recommendations that they brought forth. But certainly in their proposal, I would imagine they spoke to their success in similar projects for other districts. So I would be very interested in seeing that information that they shared. I imagine it was rather persuasive for you to select them um, to complete this work. So I will be asking the board to consider um, postponing action on this contract so that we can review that information. And the only thing that I would say in response to that, thank you, Ms. Hen, would be that, that, that an audit doesn't change results, but action does. Um, so that the actions would actually change the results. So it, it depends on the implementation. It depends on how the fidelity to uh, those actions or recommendations. Um, and so it would be very difficult for us as a school system to judge another school system's fidelity to the uh, implementation and to those actions. So audits don't change uh, results, but uh, action actually does. Ms. Hen? Oh, Mr. Offerman. Mr. Offerman, thank you. We haven't heard from you. Uh, yes, first of all, I, I think uh, uh, since we've identified mathematics as, a, as, as an important issue and place where we need, to, we need improvement, I, I applaud uh, the, the whole concept of doing this. I was wondering specifically whether there were any uh, 
in this uh, in this in, in this in, in this plan are there any uh, 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 factors such as uh, school climate or class size or uh, uh, behavioral concerns that are that they're going to play into the analysis of this or are we just looking at the mathematics of this uh, I was a math teacher for 17 years and you know I, I have some personal experience in that but those factors certainly play a major role in terms of student achievement right okay so um, the audit in particular is going to look at the curriculum, the course sequence pathways, the implementation, and the professional learning needs. In terms of our system math plan, um, as I shared before, we collaborate very closely with the school support team that spend time in individual classrooms because we know that some of the factors that you just mentioned would impact student achievement disproportionately depending on some of those other factors. So in terms of the overall response to how we're supporting math in Baltimore County, yes. In terms of the scope of this audit, climate is not a piece that we've asked Hopkins to help us look at. Sure. Ms. Hen. Oh, excuse me. Um, okay, we're gonna be quick because we're running behind schedules. So uh, Lily and then Mr. Kuhn. So as I'm sitting here, it's not necessarily that I'm opposed to an audit, but I'm finding that I have more questions than every time you answer a question, I have five more questions in my head because of the answer, and I'm just wondering, um, Ms. Causey, is, is there a mechanism within the board to where we could have a work session or have something just surrounding this issue of the math audit and the math problem itself to where we can submit additional questions and have more of this time. Is there some urgency to why, does the contract have to be passed like today or can we postpone this for a minute and, and ask more questions? Well, Ms. Hen has suggested that we postpone this to the next board meeting, which would be January 8th. The mechanism for board members um, most readily to receive information is through email, weekly update. Um, Dr. Um, Wheatley Phillips, I just want to call you by your first name, um, has referenced links to the previous um, audits that have been done by Johns Hopkins University, most recently for Montgomery County and Baltimore City. Um, scheduling a work session um, is a possibility, but I'd have to consult with uh, the interim superintendent. We have a number of meetings coming up in January, but certainly I support Getting additional information, as you mentioned, there's a number of board members that have not been on, that did not hear the performance report that was given back, um, Dr. Brown, by in September, October. So uh, it, is, it is definitely a possibility that we can facilitate more information to the board if we're able to postpone this. So do you need a motion to postpone? Ms. Hen. Thank Fine. you. So that no. is the motion oh. I'm prepared to make. Dr. Brown? Yeah. Did. So just for clarity on this um, sure <laughs> just for clarity on this oh yeah we'll swap out briefly <laughs> um, the as you pointed out the presentation on student achievement is available uh, on board docs and so you, you all can can watch that at your leisure uh, from home um, I, I don't know that we necessarily want to have to dedicate a, a whole other board session to going through that, uh, though I'm more than happy to answer people's questions uh, about it. Um, I actually find sometimes it's easier for me to watch something like that in my pajamas at home uh, and write down questions and go back and forth through it uh, over time so because I can sort of control the pace of it for myself on that. Um, and again, we'd be more than happy to answer that. But clearly, we were not seeing the movement in math that we anticipated. That being said, uh, the superintendent committed to trying to understand more about what we're doing in terms of mathematics and where, where that's falling apart. And there, there are different places that this could happen. The purpose of an audit in this case is essentially a diagnostic process. How can we dig in, learn more, and then figure out how we're going to adapt based on that information we get back. And as Ms. Shea had pointed out, you know, the first step there is, well, can we have somebody independently look at our curriculum 
and evaluate it against the standards. Does it match? Does it match in terms of the level of rigor? Uh, one thing we, we didn't mention today is the Maryland Career and College Readiness Standards are still relatively new. You know, our teachers are still acclimating to these, these standards and the gap between what the standards were in terms of the level of rigor and where they are now is substantial. So that movement was really quite substantial. So understanding whether or not our curriculum as written by our teachers aligns well to standards is a good first step in this process. For that to be actionable this year, and this is why I stood up, I have some urgency on this. For that to be actionable this year, for Ms. Shea to have an opportunity to, to use that as part of curriculum writing to inform what we do in curriculum writing this, this summer, we gotta get on the ball. <laughs> it, 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 you know, we gotta have authority, we have to write a contract. These things take a little bit of time. It's, if you guys approve this today, it's four to six weeks. Okay, before we get down that road. If we put this off to January, it really compresses and decreases likelihood that we're gonna have this as actionable information for the summer. I just want you to be aware of that. This is meant to be a diagnostic process. To the superintendent's point, it will not solve things. It will help us better understand where our problems are. And those problems could occur in different places. They could be in the curriculum or they could be in how the curriculum is enacted. We have to tease that out over time and then we can figure out what we need to do to make those improvements. I have a sense of urgency around this. I don't wanna see another year go by and I'm worried that if we kick this can down the road, we lose a curriculum writing cycle because it's unlikely we'll, we'll be able to get through that phase of this evaluation um, in a timely fashion. One last thing and then I'll get out of the way. <laughs> to Mr. Kuhn's point, um, I'm more than happy to have a conversation with Hopkins about whether or not we could look at a subset of um, curriculum resources as part of this evaluation, Dreambox being one of them. I say subset, it has to be fairly small because you know the scope of this has already been discussed at some point. We can't have a whole lot of scope creep or the price goes through the roof. And, and what we've talked about in terms of, of, of the costs associated with this is won't suffice, for the spending authority won't suffice if we have constant scope creep and go in a variety of directions. Just wanted to say that you know we have been responsive to the board in the past when they've asked us to look at additional things. I'm more than happy to entertain that. Um, again, I have a sense of urgency because I want us to be able to inform and make changes in a timely fashion. Thank you. So Dr. Brown. Excuse me, I'm gonna have Ms. Hen because we need to um, move forward. Thank you, Mrs. Causey. Seeing that we have uh, many more questions that remain unanswered, I move that the board postpone voting on this contract until the January 8th meeting, pending the re complete written response to remaining board member questions. Is there a discussion on Ms. Hen's motion? I would like to say that, uh, thank you, Dr. Brown. Um, I do like your suggestion of the new board members going back and they can watch the work session that was presented on student achievement. Um, what I would like to see is um, by tomorrow afternoon, any additional questions, if Ms. Hen's motion passes, uh, to be sent to uh, Ms. Hen and myself, and we'll aggregate them and forward them to um, the superintendent, because what I'm hearing is we have questions around the exact nature of the need in terms of what is the performance, what are the goals that we're looking for, um, also in terms of is this enough of a sense of urgency? If we can take the two weeks that we have on break where um, I understand most of the offices will be closed, though so we won't really be losing that much time in terms of number of working days that folks will have. Um, but I do think it is important. I, I've heard a lot of great points from my board members, and I really want to make sure that we understand the issues, we understand what the goals are, and if there are additional uh, goals that this board wants to include, that there's an opportunity to do that ahead of a contract being ratified. So I would support Ms. Hen's motion. Is there any other comments or questions? Uh, Ms. Ms. Rowe. Um, the student, when, what date was that presentation given? 
so that we can find it in board docs. I find that if you don't know the exact date of something, you can't find it. Okay, we'll, we'll have that sent as a link to the full board. Mm -hmm. Ms. Adekoya? So, um, Dr. Brown, with your sense of urgency, if we push this back to January 8th, um, how detrimental is it to the, because I, I visited curriculum workshop and I see how important that is and for teachers to be actually able to create math, English, reading, writing. So one that. example I'll give is that we begin hiring. We advertise for the workshops and we need to hire teachers and that opens in January. Um, and so for me to know what workshops I have to address, I'm already going to be somewhat because obviously I won't have that result. But when you hire teachers for a workshop and then the workshop shifts, so the information I get back from the audit, if they come back and say, for example, Algebra 1 is an issue. If the audit finds that, I'm going to have to make some adjustments in terms of the teachers that have been hired for the workshop um, who may or may not teach Algebra 1 if that becomes the focus of the audit. So there is a timeliness in terms of the process I have for the curriculum workshop. I can't find out in July what I'm going to work on in July because I won't necessarily have the right folks hired, if that makes sense. Thank you for that. Um, Ms. Rowe, we really need to move forward, but one final. So if they're starting their work in January and you're hiring in January, I will open, you even know that? I open the application. So we don't make okay. final recommendations for hire in January. That's just when the process starts. So we let teachers know that they can tell us they're interested. So because we knew that this was a possibility, the math team and I decided that we would advertise broadly until we knew more information and could narrow in terms of the offer. Okay. So teachers. either way, you're you're opening the hiring process either way. Okay. I just was trying to describe the other things that happen in the spring that I can't wait until July to decide what we're writing because of the pre-work that goes into planning for curriculum workshop. Certainly, and the board understands a sense of urgency. We, we have seen and heard about our math achievements and the growth that's needed in those areas. Yep. But the two weeks between now, two and a half weeks, between now and January 8th is not going to make or break this project. And in fact, if the board comes back with an even greater sense of urgency, uh, there may be modifications to this program that would in fact get us where we need to go sooner. So um, I'm going to call for the vote. All those in favor of postponing per Julie Hen's uh, motion, please raise your hand. Did you get that, Mrs. Gover? Any opposed? Are there any abstentions? Okay, thank you. The motion carries, so we will um, postpone that until January 8th. And again, I'm going to reiterate to any board members to please email Julie and I and Ms. Gover uh, by tomorrow afternoon with any uh, potential questions um, and follow up along the lines that you've talked about already here tonight. Um, thank you very much uh, to staff for all of that information and all of the preparation that was done for that. Uh, moving to our next item J, new business, board policy 8314, internal board policies and operations. I would call, call on Ms. Rowe. I'd like to make a motion to um, pass the revisions in 8314 that basically what this does is it makes it so that right now if someone wants to add something to the agenda, the vote on the board has to be unanimous. And this is kind of an irregular thing. And what the changes would be would be to change the unanimous vote to a majority vote. So that if some if something's to be added to the agenda, it would be a unanimous vote or a, a majority vote, not a unanimous vote. Is there a second? second. Any discussion? I would just offer that um, in terms of the the language here in Policy 8314 for revision, um, we are open certainly to the changes that the um, board is suggesting. However, I do have some questions in terms of the agenda items to be submitted by the board officers. 
Um, would that be, uh, is there a number, is there a limit to um, the number of items? I know that um, sometimes board members have uh, questioned in the past the length of meetings and so um, in terms of the limit of uh, num uh, items, also item C and D seem a little redundant um, to item A. And then in terms of item E, we would request five business days versus seven as it would be more aligned to uh, current practice. Uh, if not, then we're looking at a, con a, a complete sh a shift in organizational processes that would have a, um, a domino effect uh, throughout the organization. So those are my comments. So I found that getting the information the way that we get the information, it's very difficult to process the information in the limited amount of time that we're given to process the information. So I, I think seven days as opposed to five, those two additional days can make a huge difference. And the, the earlier the board can get things, the better off. And I would think that all of the board members here, if it takes a majority vote to add something to the agenda, that basically means a majority of us wanna stay here later. And there is always the option of the chair to move to move agenda items for the sake of time and vote on that. So I don't see having a a majority vote versus a unanimous vote as being a huge shift in how we do things because the chair has flexibility within a meeting. Ms. Adekoya? Was this at a policy review meeting that I wasn't present at? I'm confused. Is this a policy? No, this was an item that was added to the board by a majority of members of the board. Okay. Are there other questions or comments? Um, Ms. White, as to your questions about the, um, the number of items, um, right now there's not anywhere that indicates a number of items that would be considered for the agenda. So it would be up to the um, superintendent and the board officers to, to um, discuss that and then have approval. Um, as to the issues of item C and D being redundant, item C, paragraph C, excuse me, says agenda items shall include matters proposed by the superintendent as well as issues of concern and interest raised by the board or by individual members of the board. That's the what and then the D, D is more of the how. Board members may submit to the superintendent or the board chair a proposed agenda item for consideration at a future board member. I think the biggest concern to address um, is the uh, number of days in advance that would be um, effective for uh, staff to be able to give the board information ahead of time for best preparation, but that would also meet the time frames of the system. So, and, and like I said, we're open to um, looking at all of those practices. My, um, my only point is that typically, and to Ms. Adekoya's point, typically an item like this would go through policy review committee where, it would, uh, where we would go through the three reader process and as a staff be able to kind of outline some of those systems that I suggested would, would be a little cumbersome um, for staff. We are not uh, opposed to um, the various changes. We're just, uh, you know, the, um, with the waiving, I, I'm assuming, of the, um, the three reader process, where especially where the public is not included, um, just uh, doesn't allow us an opportunity to share um, uh, from an organizational standpoint some of the domino effect uh, on the organization. Certainly, we will respect the board's decision if this is um, the new policy and the change will be made tonight, we will make those changes accordingly. Ms. Hen. Thank you, Mrs. Causey. I would ask um, Ms. Rowe if she would consider amending her motion to suspend the rules and consider waiving the three reader policy in order to consider this policy this evening. Yeah. Can I suggest that can somebody make that as a separate motion? I think that needs to be moved on and voted on because that's not debatable. It needs a two thirds vote. So. Then I would ask Ms. Rowe to withdraw her I motion. I will withdraw my motion. I will make the motion then that we suspend the rules and waive three reader policy in order to consider policy 8314 as is. So that's not debatable and it's two-thirds vote. 
So all those in favor of waiving the, the practice of three reader for our policies uh, so that we could pass this um, policy in order to open up in inclusivity to all board members to affect the agenda, which had not happened prior. Um, that, that's the motion. So all those in favor of Ms. Hen's motion, please raise your hand. All those opposed? Ms. Foster? I'm, I'm missing a piece here. This has become in my brain so convoluted. I'm not sure what the vote is. So I will just have to say I lost some way along the journey. Um, okay. What it is. Mm -hmm. I okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. Abstaining is perfectly fine. So that motion passes. Thank you. Thank you. So motion to approve policy 8314 with the changes proposed. Second. Okay, so now we're having any additional questions or discussion on adopting policy 8314 that's been distributed to board members both last week, ahead of last week's meeting where this was postponed because of time to this meeting. So all the, is there any more questions or discussion about that? Yes, Ms. Scott. Uh, yes, I just wanted to make sure because um, I don't want anyone to feel confused or, or anything like that. I just wanted to know if you could summarize again. As I understand it, it's so that we can add to the agenda, um, given the timeline that you said five to seven days beforehand, so that any board member can do that to, so that it's a more inclusive process. Um, if you could expand more upon that, sort of just maybe giving us a little bit more information. Certainly, just the, to recap the background that was emailed out to board members, is that formerly, uh, contrary to Robert's Rules of Order, this policy stated it needed to be unanimous for any agenda item to be added or changed at, at the board meetings, which would have, for instance, prevented tonight from us hearing about the, our Maryland Blue Ribbon if there was one member that prevented that vote. So what's more standard is to have a majority of the board be able to act on amending the agenda. Okay, so that's issue one. Um, the other issue is we're asking the system to increase the number of days in advance of board meetings where, where, the, where possible, which is in there, where possible, for the board to receive the documents that they need and it'll also be open to the public at sooner. Yes. Oh. <clears throat> so we'll that Ms. Pasture. Okay, so we're asking now. We are asking now that we extend the number of days for any of us to process, is that right, if we want to amend the agenda yes no no those are two separate issues one issue is being able to amend the agenda at the board meeting yes whereas now it requires a unanimous vote which we would go to a majority okay we would yes. go to a majority that's simple. and that's one of our goals to be more inclusive of board members yes okay um and the second issue is to um require where, where, where possible to increase the time that the system submits the documents for the, for the agenda, our board docs opens up sooner than it does now. So it would open up board docs to the board members and also to the public sooner than it does now. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right, so we have an apple and an orange on this table. We have board docs here. And then we're talking about making, um, uh, changing the agenda on the spot with a majority vote. Yes. One not having anything to do with the other. Same Is that policy. right? 
They're in the same policy. Same policy. Okay, but they are two separate considerations. Yes, that's true. Okay. Okay, All Mr. Right. Kuhn. Because that's it. Just, just so I'm clear, um, the change associated with getting materials to the board and making them public is going from five days to seven days. There was never a day in oh, there. Oh, I'm time sorry. I thought. In there. Typically. But typically. Oh, okay. I thought this has been. But I didn't there was see it written in, in there, policy. so I was right. like. Typically do get the board agenda out about five days um, prior to the, the, board, um, the board meeting. And so, again, we're not opposed to that. Certainly, if the, the board requests that information uh, days ahead of time, we can do that. Typically, though, in a PRC meeting, we would be able to kind of flesh out organizationally what that would mean for the organization, um, for the board's uh, consideration. Um, because anything that you do here, of course, what gets governed gets done. Uh, so um, without that type of discussion, you won't have the benefit of that, that information. Any other questions or comments? Okay, all those in favor of changing policy 8314, uh, the draft. Oh, I'm sorry, Ms. Ong. What is the number limit of agenda amendments so we're not here till late? There's not a number. It'll take the majority of the board. So as Ms. Rowe pointed out, if there's a majority of the board that wants to add an agenda item, it's because the majority of the board wants to proceed to do work on it. Some agenda items may be one minute but it would depend. Is there like a system of what should actually be an agenda item? Or well, what yes, can we, be answered? There's very, specific ish, uh, there's very specific agenda items that we work through on a regular basis. Okay. All right, no problem. Any other questions or comments? Ms. Rowe? I just want to answer um, Ms. Adequoy's question part of the reason why this is important to do this is because let's say for instance a majority of the board were taking a desire to block a specific issue from ever appearing on the agenda so that it would never be discussed right or even if let's say hypothetically our chair decided to do that just hypothetically right having a unanimous vote to add something to the agenda pretty much means you can never add anything to the agenda. So let's say hypothetically that we had a chair who never wanted to allow a particular topic to be on the agenda. It would, if you could have seven people who wanted to say, we're gonna talk about this regardless of what one person thinks, the changes to this policy allow that to happen. Right now, it'd be almost impossible for a majority of people on this board to get every single person to vote to go against the chair because the chair could be the one that says no. <laughs> Do you see? Mr. McMillian. I, th I think a concrete example of that was about six or eight weeks ago when there was a desire to get the transportation on to the agenda and then it was unsuccessful for a number of weeks because they couldn't get the number of people that they needed you couldn't get an unanimous vote so in that case if the majority voted the transportation could have been on the uh, on the agenda a whole lot quicker that's correct okay um so i'm going to call for the vote all those in favor of the motion to accept the changes to policy 8314 in the draft version one that was emailed to all the board members, uh, please raise your hand. Any opposed? And abstaining? Okay, thank you. Thank you, the motion carries. The next the next item on the agenda, new business system record retention, item K. I yes, make, Mr. Kuhn. I make a motion on data retention. Uh, 
The motion is uh, the board directs the interim superintendent and all BCPS personnel to immediately cease and desist in the routine or non-routine destruction of any and all school system documents and records that are subject to retention according to the BCPS record retention schedule, board policy, or applicable laws and regulations until further directed direction by the board. Further, the board directs that a litigation hold be placed on all system records that may reasonably be important to all phases of the contracts, procurement, and vendor relationships audit, including any further action which may be taken in response to the audit findings. Thank you. Is there a second? Second. Is there any discussion? I'd Ms. Like Rowe. To, I'm sorry. I'd like to chime in as well. Okay. Ms. Rowe. I'm sorry. I just wanted to ask the school system if they had comments on this or <laughs> a response. I'm sure we're about to get some comments. Oh, yes. Well, Absolutely. I didn't we're see Ms. Comments. Howie step up to the podium. <laughs> <laughs> well, actually, the system does have questions. Um, it is not clear which records would be um, covered by this, um, and the system would simply need to know whether or not uh, basically what the board is asking is that um, school system personnel no longer destroy or purge any documents at any time. Thank you. I can answer those questions. This was an item that was postponed from the meeting last week, and there were uh, documents that were sent ahead of that meeting last week that applied to this. Our board attorney told us those documents were internal documents and could not be shared on uh, board docs, but there is the 31-page record retention schedule that very specifically outlines system documents that the system is required to maintain, either by law, policy, regulation, um, or choice. Um, that record retention schedule is supposed to be filed with the Maryland State Archives, so it's a clearly spelled out document. As opposed to the uh, cease and desist motion that was passed earlier this fall that was rather ambiguous relating to personnel with executive director positions and above, that does not clearly spell out system documents, and there was confusion around what documents were going to be included, and there were questions that were not answered. So in looking to find answers to the questions that were not answered previously, uh, this record retention document became known, and it very clearly spells out what system documents are and how long they're supposed to be maintained. So rather than come up with a new list, we're using a system document, and in the real impact is instead of uh, destroying something maybe next week or in a month or two months when the regular destruction cycle comes up, we're asking the system to maintain these documents until the external audit is completed and the board decides that we can let the system destroy documents per the regular schedule. So I will ask Ms. Howie to um, update the board on where we are thus far. Um, with um, this entire uh, issue. But I would remind the board, and again, with policy 8314, I, like I said, um, we are more than willing to, to um, honor those, those requests. I do have serious concerns, though, with the motion that is um, before you, and that is because when we, when in the motion, when it says the destruction of routine or non-routine documents, for instance, the last time this, the, the board uh, issued a directive in this way, it almost brought our system to a screeching halt. It was a tremendous burden on our teachers, on our school administrators, um, and the and the like. Um, teachers had um, you know have very a lot of concerns with um, which documents to be able to purge and which ones not to. Um, it was a, a point of confusion. Keep in mind that the directive, as Ms. Causey said, is still in place uh, for executive director and above. Uh, and so although that is uh, quite burdensome at that level as well, at least it doesn't create that same burden on our classroom teachers um, where 
uh, again, anything that anyone has needed um, has been available. And let's keep in mind that the state archivist um, has gone on record saying that our process is okay and that it's uh, that it's sound. And so, Ms. Uh, Howie, I'll have you um, kind of fill us in on where we are to date with the records retention. Sure, and I provided to the board um, a timeline of contacts with the uh, Maryland State Archives as well as with the Department of General Services um, since uh, September of this year. The superintendent uh, directed uh, that staff should standardize processes. One of the things that was discovered when the board asked in September about how documents were retained and how they were purged was that there was a non-standard process throughout the school system. As a result, uh, the superintendent now has Superintendent's Rule 2380, which establishes throughout the school system a standard records retention program. That program is described on the intranet site with specific processes, specific permissions that must be requested and sought prior to purging any school system document. As well, the superintendent wanted to make it clear that the program in the school system had been reviewed at the state level. So as a result of the superintendent's directive and vision, the schedule has been sent to the Maryland State Archives no fewer than three times. It's now before the Department of General Services uh, to review three parts of the schedule. Again, those are posted on the intranet site. But in the interim, the schedule that is currently posted on the intranet site is in full force and effect, and the process for seeking permission prior to the purging of any documents is also on the intranet site, consistent with standardization across the system. I have a question. Superintendent's Rule 2380, when was that developed and implemented? It was implemented and approved on the 20th of November, 2018. And when you say approved, it was approved by the superintendent? It was presented to the board on November 20th, 2018. On that same day, prior to your board meeting, there was a request from one of the former board members for three changes to the rule. Uh, the superintendent is not required, absent a board vote, to implement changes in a superintendent's role. However, at least one of the changes recommended by the board member was uh, placed in the superintendent's role. Yes. If that's a confidential item, the I superintendent's role? No, the process of how that was modified according to a former board member. Um, I don't believe so. Okay, well, mm -hmm. I, I think it's important that this board understand, this board, understand the former rule and the change to the rule. So if you could please submit that information. So are, are you suggesting that while- It was submitted when the, when the request was responded to. All board members received the response. On November 20th? Yes, ma'am. Okay, so um, so that's in board docs then. The I former it was sent via electronic mail. Okay, so we'll go back and look at that. So what you're saying is that there was inconsistency in in retention and destruction across the schools, and because of the focus of this board on that issue, that there's been improvements. What I'm saying is that the, it was clear that certain schools and certain offices were not following the schedule that uh, was in force at the time. 
So as a result of there being inconsistencies across the system and lack of clarity on the part of some of our schools and offices, and that is not unusual given the size of the system, the superintendent's directive was that there would be a records retention program. State law, Title 10, does require a records retention program for every unit of state government. But the Board of Education is not a unit of state government, notwithstanding the lack of applicability of the statute to the local board, the superintendent still indicated that some sort of program, given that there is a state law and state regulations that apply, that was the easiest way to move forward. Well, thank you for that explanation. Ms. Rowe? So you're familiar with the schedule and what's on it for record retention and when things can be um, disposed of and not purged yet. Yeah. Okay, so is it the contention of the school system that it's unreasonable to cease purging items on that record before the audit is finished? I don't believe contention would be uh, an accurate description, uh, an accurate adjective. I do believe that it is, it will be difficult given the manner in which the initial directive was issued for the school system, all schools, all offices, to cease and desist immediately any purging of any files. It doesn't say any purging of any files. It says... It says anything that is on the so records retention What he read today schedule. is here. Yes, ma'am, I do have Okay, it. but any files is any files. Any, any files on the records retention schedule is not the same thing as a hall pass. <laughs> so what I want to clarify is that is, is it the opinion of the school system that it is unreasonable for this board to request that items on the schedule, instead of being purged according to the schedule, simply be held and not purged until after the audit. And do you think that given that we're having an audit, that that doesn't create a compelling need to preserve documentation that auditors might need to look at? If there are specific documents, obviously, and that's in the superintendent's rule and in the procedures, that if there are specific documents that are subject to audit, it is absolutely reasonable that those documents that are subject to the audit be maintained. And based on the scope of the audit, any of those kinds of things are already being maintained. And keep in mind that it has never come to my attention that the auditors have asked for anything that they haven't been able to retain or haven't had access to. So again, um, when we say that the routine or non-routine destruction of any and all school system documents, I believe that that would create a hardship on our teachers, um, and unnecessarily so. Are there specific documents that the board wishes retained? The ones on the list. I mean, the records. The list? That, yeah, that's what the directive says. It doesn't say every single document in the whole school system. It says the ones on the list. And just about every document on the record retention schedule is just about every document that is maintained by the school system. Are there documents on the record retention schedule that you think should not be included in this directive? That is not my concern. My concern is that if the board wishes to issue a directive, you have the perfect authority to do so. My question on behalf of the system, on behalf of the schools and offices in the system, is whether or not it's necessary to write um, directives so broadly that it then burdens the school system in such a way that we're not able to operate efficiently. And if, if there are specific documents, of course, the staff will maintain them. I'm suggesting that you could narrow the scope by telling us which items on the records retention schedule would create a burden for the school system, which might also not be applicable to the audit. And my question to the board is that the staff would appreciate 
additional clarification on which documents you b believe to be necessary in order to go forward in the audit. All right, so we're in an impasse here then because we believe all of the ones on the records retention schedule are necessary and you're unwilling to tell us which ones you think might not be necessary. It's not that I'm so unwilling, ma'am. Where's our dialogue here? Excuse I'm not me, unwilling, ma'am. Not at all. Excuse me. Uh, Ms. Joes has not entered into the conversation. She's been waiting. Thank you. Well, since we were not part of the board in oh, sorry. Hey. Well, since we were not part of the board on November 20th, I would like to request to postpone this matter. I want to review this document the policy um, 2318, the superintendent's rule, before I make a decision on it. Excuse me? Do you There's a motion on the floor. Is there a second? Is there a second? second. Oh, second. Well, well, well. No, it's a motion to postpone. That's, that's oh, okay. appropriate. You, you made a motion to postpone. Motion yes, sir. There's already a motion. Okay, so we have a motion by Ms. Joes to postpone, and Ms. Adequoya, did you second that? Second. Oh, and Ms. Pasture, thank you. Uh, is there discussion on the motion to postpone? Just so we're clear, we're talking, you mentioned t Rule 2380. You're not talking about that because that's already set, right? We're talking about a chance to review it. Oh. Are we talking about yeah, the motion? Yeah, I would like to review it before I make a decision. Are there other comments, Ms. Hen? Thank you, Mrs. Causey. I would like to speak to the directive that we're discussing. Um, not that I'm not in favor of postponing, but I would like to provide some additional information. And that is, I think, what would shed some light on this matter for us, especially considering many of us are new, are really to revisit our role as a board and what we learned at the MABE orientation in terms of our responsibilities. We set policy for the system. It is our superintendent's responsibility to direct how that policy is implemented. I think we're getting dragged into the implementation details where we don't necessarily need to be or want to be and are overstepping our bounds. And I want to make sure that we're not stepping on our superintendent's authority to um, decide how to implement our directive and how to minimize the impact on the system. That is not our role as board members. That's why we trust our superintendent to take care of those details, to minimize the impact on our teachers. Um, we set the directive. It is up to the system to carry out that directive. So hopefully that, that helps because I, I don't want to see us dragged into an area of responsibility that is not ours. Any other comments about postponing? Um, I would just also like to do a little background information and also to respond specifically um, to some of the points that were made. Um, to, to back up, the, this process of trying to preserve system documents began when this board was alerted by journalists that we had over 2,400 ethics financial disclosure forms destroyed in the midst of discussions at all levels of the board, the county, and the state, including the um, Maryland State Department of Education, as to doing an external audit based on ethical and criminal behavior from a former employee. Uh, so in the opinion of some members of the board, a majority of which in August passed a motion to cease and desist destruction of documents, there is concern that the system left to itself it destroyed 2,400 ethic financial disclosure forms. We, in fact, started an external audit in May, and the scope of that included the year 2012 in a procurement audit. Now, procurement has to abide by all of our policies and rules, including our ethics policies uh, and uh, policies that relate specifically to vendor interaction, vendor influence, uh, what's disclosed on our ethics financial disclosure forms. So that's the backdrop for this consideration. Do we, uh, and as to the point that um, Ms. White s uh, made that the auditors, to her knowledge, have not uh, suggested they can't find any documents, uh, this board has not received any update from the external audit. I uh, attended the last audit committee meeting 
and there was not a written update there stating whether the auditors had indeed found everything that they wanted. Um, and there was supposed to be a scheduled update which was snowed out. So there has not been a written update to this board to understand whether the auditors have in fact asked for documents that they cannot find. Additionally, this is phase one of the external audit. So they may, based on the findings, implement phase two. So we're not talking about what do we know we need today. We're talking about what might need to be known in the future to clear the cloud that was placed over us by others. So we're trying to do that business of the board, which is to uh, rebuild confidence in our system and in our governance of the system. Uh, so that is the backdrop, and that's the answer to one question that was raised. Um, are, if there's any other comments or questions, I'll take them now, and then we'll vote on the motion to postpone. Okay, so right now we're voting on Ms. Joe's motion to postpone uh, until the next meeting? Yes. Until the next meeting. All those in favor, raise your hand. Ms. Gover, do you have that? All those opposed? Just going to abstain. And one abstention. So the Ms. Gover does not so seven for okay. the motion to postpone passes. So we will um, any questions or comments that the board members have, please submit to uh, me and Ms. Hen and Ms. Gover, um, and also um, Ms. White. Any questions that you have, please uh, submit them, Ms. Howie, and then we will uh, reconvene on this issue on January eighth. So thank you for that consideration, and that leads us to item L, work session report on the fiscal year 2020 county capital budget. If uh, Mr. Smith and Mr. Saris could please come forward. Following the presentation, allowing time for discussion if the board so desires. So we will let them work through their presentation first and then entertain questions afterwards. Chairwoman Kazi, Vice Chair Hen, Superintendent White, and members of the board. Um, we are, I am joined by Mr. George Saris and Mr. Pete Dixit to present to you the county capital budget for FY 2020. I'll give you a little bit of history. The, the state capital budget has already been approved by the board, the previous board, and these, this is merely the county's support of those projects moving forward. Before we start, I do want to indicate, as the superintendent mentioned last meeting when it was shared related to the high school pass capacity study, that study does not directly impact this capital plan here. We are at the 50% phase of funding by the state now, which you'll see on this as Mr. Dixit goes through this. So I just want to make sure I clarify those points. You were, you received a document, uh, a file last week indicating the submission that we submitted to the, um, to the, to the IEC related to our capital request for FY20. That is a voluminous document and it's a it's a living document because there are a host of questions going back and forth between that agency and our departments and school systems trying to make sure that they have the information in order to continue the funding. It's a cash flow mechanism that Mr. Dixit will indicate later on. As you move through this presentation, you'll see we have a timeline of where we are with this. The timeline is um, last week, um, Superintendent White and our team went to the IEC to um, continue our steps in moving this FY 2020 capital request forward, uh, requesting additional support for the funds uh, for the projects that we have now. There, the IEC had an opportunity to ask questions. We provided information. 
in addition to the, the large document that they have, as well as multiple conversations and calls and interactions between our team and, and the State Department to getting information. The piece that we're presenting to you now is our work with our local partners as it relates to the capital requests we have now. I won't go through these dates because you can see them now. The, the dates that are important tonight is that um, we're doing a work session tonight and presenting this to you. It's been on the website. It's not something that is uh, sort of new. It's just the other layers of the funding that's coming from this, the local, our local county dollars um, related to that. Um, at our next board meeting, we will have a work session to discuss further questions that you may have, and you can submit those questions through the chair and vice chair and the superintendent, and we will try to address those questions as well. Um, after that, in January 24th, we'll take uh, the superintendent and the team will go to the um, county planning board to present the capital plan that we have for FY 2020. Um, during that time, as we move through the process in March, we'll be moving to the 90% funding level, and then in May, the 100% funding level, it'll go to the legislator in May of 2019, and the final letter of approval will come in June of um, 2019. With that being said, I will turn it over to Mr. Dixit, who which will, walk, which will walk you through the process. It's a pretty long presentation because we wanted to make sure with you Coming on board, we wanted to give you a breakdown of how the capital plan looks and what are the various columns and how we have them grouped in our four major categories. With that being said, Mr. Dixon, please. Thank you. Good evening, Chair Ms. Causey, Vice Chair Ms. Hen, Superintendent White, and board members. Uh, we are going to go through the plan, but I thought for the benefit of new board members, it will be good if I give you some backdrop information about what this whole process is. There are a lot of moving pieces to it, and it's a dynamic process, which will be updated periodically. But before we go into that, I just want to say that the capital program, the purpose of the capital program is to fund design and construction of new schools, renovation schools, and systemic projects. Systemic projects typically are parts of the building. They are, com they are not the building itself, but it could be roof, it could be boiler, it could be chiller, it could be windows, so it's a component of the building. And capital program includes major projects. By major projects, we mean those are, that are not typical repair but replacement projects and have generally a life of more than 15 years. Now, in there someplace, there, there might be some smaller projects to meet the needs of the system, but most of them are major projects. It will really help if you save your questions till the end, because a lot of questions that come to you, by the time we finish it, perhaps you'll have the answer to that. The county, the, the, the funding is provided by two sources. One is the state and the other the county and they obtain funds by issuing bonds. So state and county both issue bonds for, for capital program. State issues bonds every year, and county does that every two years. So just keep that in mind that the money is not coming from operating budget, but it's coming from bonds. And just to give you some idea about what money we are talking about, you will know the details of the funding, but just have to quantify as to how much money is available. The county has provided approximately 75 million each year, and they are talking about raising that number so it may go up. The state has provided between 40 and 50 million dollars per year. So we have a total annual program in the range of 110, 120, and 130 million dollars, depending on the projects and depending on what our needs is and how we compete with the other local subdivisions in the state. When we look at this quantity of money, amount of money available, and when we look at the needs, it will answer a lot of questions that why is my school or why is my project not on the capital list. The needs are well over a couple of billion dollars in terms of, so the needs far exceed the available capital funds. The, the superintendent and uh, her team annually prepare and update the capital program. 
So this is an annual process, and typically the start of the process is when we submit our state program in August, September timeframe, and we come to board before submitting it for your approval. Our priorities are guided by additional seats, crucial improvements that are needed in aging infrastructure, and the comments that we receive, that superintendent receives in her meeting with stakeholders, and the comments that you receive here in board meeting. All of them are just combined together to develop our priorities and we present it to the board for their approval. The board already approved, as Mr. Smith indicated, in the September 11th meeting, the state share of the capital program. So this is just additional information and includes county fund to support the projects that were approved by the board in, the, in that plan. So in addition to that, there are some projects that we'll share with you as we go through it that are added to the county portion because they are not funded by the state. So with that, we'll be presenting our county capital program. Mr. Smith has already shared the timeline, so I'm not going to go into that. The first column of the uh, county program that you have in front of you is the priority order. So if you look at priority, it's, it's um, one through 47. The first 40 priorities are specific individual pro projects. If you see in the red uh, uh, rectangle in, the, in, the, in this diagram, so these are the specific, specific individual large projects for which funding is requested. And the next seven priority are totally locally funded projects. These projects typically are fuel tank replacement, mm -hmm. accessibility, transportation improvement, deferred maintenance, roof replacement, and site improvement. These projects do, are not, they do not have any state participation. And, the next column shows the school where the projects will be implemented. So that's the prioritized list of the schools. After that, you see the column where the area of the county where the school is, is identified. The next column shows what type of project is this. Is this a new school? Is this a limited renovation? Is this a replacement school? And these categories have to be defined as per the IAC guidelines. So this, this is the relevance of that. The column after that shows the type of approval being, uh, being requested. It could be a planning approval or a funding approval. Planning means that we are requesting state to approve the planning of the project so that we can start with the design and typically it takes anywhere from six months to 12 months to plan the building. Planning is required from the state before we can start uh, request for funding of schools. So that's the difference there. The column after that is the percentage of free and reduced meals in that, is, in that school. And th the next column is the total amount of funding being requested of the state. So in this column, you see the total amount of the state uh, money. Uh, I need to share at this point that the state money can, can come in different phases because it depends on the cash flow as to when the project is being implemented. So if we only need part of the project for funding, that's how it is funded by the state. The column after that shows the state funding that has already been received. So, so that funding has already been received from the state. The column after that is the, the amount of funding that was recommended by the public school construction program staff to the interagency commission. Those, this is the amount of funds that state has, uh, the state PSCP has, has forwarded to IAC for the funding. 
the next column which respond which represents the amount of funding is still needed by a particular project for FY 2020. And as you will see that there are the funds may be need, needed next year based on the cash flow. So we also show the FY 2021 uh, cash flow, the amount that will be requested next year. Now, what is the next three column represent the county portion of the capital budget? The first of the next three column represent the amount of funding appropriated in previous years by the county for that particular project. And the next column shows the amount of funding that will be needed um, in FY2020. The last column represents the total amount of proposed county funding for that particular project. There are some footnotes in that slide, so we'll go that. The, the footnote one just uh, describes the planning approval or the funding approval needed. Footnote two explains that this column represents the total amount of funding being requested of the state. Footnote three, as we discussed earlier, explains that this column is the amount of funding that was recommended by the public school construction staff to the interagency commission. Footnote four explains that the state funding may be spread over multiple years, as I explained to you earlier. Each year represents the cash flow for that year. Footnote five is is, is it indicates that the scope is, uh, scope study is underway to establish the scope of work for the project. That's Pine Grove Middle School, Red House Run, Deer Park, and Scotts Branch. Footnote six is the county funding may be spread over multiple, multiple years to align with the cash flow of the project. Footnote seven explains that the Baltimore County will forward fund the state aid portion of these seven projects from the sale of bonds. Now these, pro these projects were included in 2018 bond referendum. And this, is, this includes Dundalk Elementary School, Berkshire Elementary School, Colgate Elementary School, Chadwick, Northeast area at Ridge Road, Bedford, and Summit Park. Footnote eight explains that the order in which Delaney High School, Towson, and Lansdowne are listed above, as Mr. Smith indicated, high school projects will be revisited next year. So this is just based on the approval last year, but after the recommendations from the high school are presented here and discussed, they are subject to change based on the results of the high school study. And footnote nine explains that county has uh, provided design funds for two high schools. And we haven't decided which two high schools that will be the outcome of the high school study and after discussion with the board. Now, we have, I have described to you the structure of this slide. Now I'll go over some of the priorities. Priorities one through 10, 11, 16, and 17 represent our request for new schools. Those schools are Honeygo Elementary Schools, Northeast Area Elementary School at Ridge Road, and the Northeast Area Middle Schools. Priority two and three are for funding of high school renovation projects at Patapsco High School and Woodlawn High Schools. These high schools renovations are already under construction. Priorities four through nine, 12 through 15, 22, 20 through 23 are requests for replacement of Dundalk Elementary School, Berkshire Elementary School, Colgate, Chadwick, Bedford, Summit Park, Red House Run, and Deer Park Elementary School. Priorities 18, 19, and 24, 25 are requests for renovation and addition projects at Pine Grove Middle Schools and Scotts Branch Elementary School. Priority 26 through 28 
are for high schools that have been discussed. 29 through 36 are for systemic projects. Systemic projects include roof replacement, boilers, and chillers. Priorities two and three show our request for two high school renovation projects, Patapsco and Woodlawn. I think I already took care of all of these things here. Um, this ends the uh, formal presentation. I just want to acknowledge the support that the state has provided us and uh, the continuous support that the county has provided for funding of these construction projects. And all I will add to what Mr. Dixon has said, th this is a fluid sheet. So this sheet ever moves because as the funding comes in from the state, as they go through design, construction, planning, it goes through many different phases. So we went through every item there, we went through every column, so you'd have some point of context. A lot of times when we discuss things, you're only gonna see this one sheet, but what you understand behind that is that huge document that you got, that's, it's like a binder that we work in tandem with our local and state partners in making sure that they have the information they need related to all of these columns, all of these roles, all of these projects, community input to make sure that our funding continues on each of these projects from both state and local projects that we have identified. As you see, other projects will come as we move into different capital years. Um, these are the projects that are currently underway or in various phases of design, planning, and construction. Some of them, for example, Honeygo. Honeygo is at the tail end of completion. We broke, we uh, introduced and had our new students in there this year. It's still on the capital plan because the funding pieces are catching up. It's the cash flow. They don't give us all of the money in the first year. It gives the state an opportunity to manage its dollars because it will take us multiple years to complete those projects. With that being said, I know it was a lot, and I promise you, you will understand this one sheet and the one document in time. You're not gonna get this the first day out. It's just, this is, this is a one pager, but it comes with a, a phone book of other things behind it. You will get it and you will understand it as we move through this. At this time, Madam Chair, we're available to answer any questions, knowing that we will have a work session next um, next board meeting as well, and we will take questions that may come as well. Okay, and I do want to thank you for that presentation. And I do know that there were questions that were submitted in advance regarding uh, the capital budget. I think maybe as part of buildings and contracts. Oh no, the, it was capital budget. Um, but we'll start with questions. We'll try and c keep them brief because the evening it has gotten away from us. So we'll start with Ms. Rother, Mr. Kuhn, and anyone else. Just let me know. Thanks. So. The phone book of information that goes behind that document, mm -hmm. can I have it, please? You, Board you, already has a copy you, of you it. No, I've it. already read the 350-page operating budget. There's l fewer than five or 10 pages regarding the capital budget. I would like the phone book that's in all of your gentlemen's heads behind that, that's, that document that you have right there, that table, that is an appendix to a document a whole bunch of people with master's degrees and doctorates wrote. I would like that document, please, <laughs> because then we could all read it and understand this stuff in a day or two. Depends how fast you read. Let, let me answer that. When we submitted a state capital program, that document was created and a copy was shared with the board. So um, board office has a copy so of that document. So I was sworn in on December 3rd. Okay. So. That we will work with the superintendent to get, we, yeah. we, yeah. Okay. we don't mind passing out yeah. phone books, we're good. <laughs> Doesn't matter to us, we're good. <laughs> we, you got it, we got your phone book coming. So it's, okay. it's not a problem, we don't, we're not holding it sacred, so. For, we, for the benefit of new board members, can you identify the name of that phone book? You had a question. She, we'll get to my question, what was phone, the name of the document? The name of the phone book, please? It, it is official, the, the, the document is Submission of Capital Improvement Program to the State. Great, thank you. Um, 
I've got some basic questions because, like you said, it's going to take a while. Uh, and thank you. This is a tremendous amount of data. You went over it well. It's probably good that you cut me off early so I could try and answer some of my questions. One of the things that I'm not clear on is um, the planning money. So you spoke to, and you kind of made it sound like the state may provide some planning money, but it's not clear to me. I thought we... Yeah, that's a good question. Let me, let me try to explain that. Under the, under the regulations of IAC, we have to get planning approval from state. But state does not fund planning. The money for design comes from local sources, which, which is county government. But we cannot start with planning without getting state's approval. Now, what we do a lot of times is that start planning anticipating that the state will plan because it's a, it's a continuous conversation with the state mm. we let them know that we are going to submit it that our county has provided funding for that and they understand that and when the time comes for submission we we request approval for planning and construction both at the same time i'm gonna try to abbreviate that we can't do construction through the state without having the planning phase. The planning phase, they don't fund the planning phase, but we still must follow their processes in order to have a planning phase. On the capital plan, we have to show both the planning phase and the funding phase for construction. So, so regardless that's, of that's they, why there's the P and F. And F so. Yes, sir. Okay, that makes good sense. So, kind of going back to the, the so we basically have to say, hey, state. We'd like to plan all of these schools. Yes. Give us a thumbs up and we're off to the races That's with our right. own county dollars, and, right? And, and it's not only that, when you see the state's submission, they require a lot of background information as to why you need or why do you need to plan this school? How many seats? What are the enrollment projections? Projections for this year and seven years down the road. So we work closely with Dr. Brown's team in, in, in providing that information. Once you get a chance to look at that submission document, you'll see the amount of forms and the information that they require. So what they need to see is that you need seats or the condition of the building is bad. What is the rationale for your request? Okay. Um, we talked about how much money the state comes up with every year. We're all anticipating that that's gonna change based on we recent so. news, right, we yeah. hope so, and, and we're hoping that that happens. Uh, just so I'm clear and everyone else is, and you hinted, you, you talked about it, uh, Mr. Smith, you said that some of this is cash flow just bouncing from state to county, right? right. So in essence, we've already built the first one, that, that is built and there are kids in it. Correct. Now, we're literally, we have Ford funded it and now we're just receiving the cash back, yes. and that's this is just an accounting exercise. That's right. That's right. That's you. You are absolutely right. Got it. You got it. We have to leave it there until we get all of the Money. resources from the state, so that you can see how those dollars come in <laughs> for each of those projects. Once, the, once we get all of the funding, it relieves and it disappears off the list. Mm -hmm. So uh, I'm just going to ask one more question because we have more to talk about. Um, if we wanted to be aggressive, um, having uh, looked at the high school capacity study and, and we understand that there's capacity issues, not even outside of high schools, um, and this board came up with ideas in conjunction with the central office uh, support and said, look, we need to do a massive amount of planning here. Um, and we, we just, you know, made it our business to submit all that to the state to just line up this pipeline of work that has to occur. Um, is this back and forth in the work sessions and everything we're working on, this is the time to do it? It is, but let me just share one point. Fortunately or unfortunately, when this new board came on, we're halfway through where the process. So this, this one is literally halfway through the process before it completes. So as new projects that this board deems necessary from conversations, it will matriculate in subsequent capital requests because this one is more than 50% underway. And when we went the other day, the 75% allocation is coming very soon in the next 
month or so. So we're already on the way here. So it won't necessarily affect this capital request, but the FY 2021, certainly, Mr. Kuhn. And then, I, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm still going on, but the planning funds for the high schools that are listed here, right, those, do those dollars exist somewhere so that we can those, get moving on those? Th those dollars are earmarked. The county, th those are all county dollars. They've set aside so in the neighborhood of $30 million for two high school projects, replacement right. projects. They ha we have three here, but we haven't identified what they would be pending the outcome of the high school capacity study, as well as further discussions with this board, with the community, as it relates to what are those project orders. Because with the high schools, timing is going to be of the essence, because the, n the nature of the projects which for us, it takes us anywhere from five to six, five to six years to plan, design, build, and deliver a high school. So you're talking five years for us to get one all the way through the process. And the cost is in excess of $100 million. To Mr. Dixit's earlier uh, comment, we get with our state piece and our local piece is around $130 million, best case scenario in recent history. Hopefully that will increase. So one high school project literally spends all of the capital dollars for the full year. You've got 47 items. So now one project, there, there's everything else has to be locally funded. So that's why we have to plan them in an appropriate, that's why this study was done to get, to get input so that as we identify those high school projects, they make sense as it relates to the cash flowing and the available resources. That was a long answer to. Uh, that was a great answer, thank you. Um, I know I've asked lots of questions. Um, okay. What threw me was just the zeros straight across on the high school. So it's that zeros aren't the case. You've got $30 million sitting somewhere. Right, yes. Right? Yes, right. Earmarked for high school planning. Correct, for two projects. It's about $15 million for, for two pro each, for each project, yes sir. Okay. Thank you. Does anyone else have questions? Before we go back to Ms. Rowe. Okay. Chairwoman, if I'm not looking at you and you feel the need to interrupt me. So, I have a lot of questions. What decides the order of the priority numbers and how is that likely to change in July? The priorities are set based on, we had indicated that there were four initial priorities that come from discussions from this board, our funding agencies as it relates to what are our priorities. P previously, and I would say still now, AC was the number one priority. So mm -hmm. we had a lot of AC projects. Now we're down to less than 10. So it's still our number one priority, but there, every project that is without AC is in some degree represented on this capital plan. So it's still our number one priority, but it's similar to that previous conversation, it's coming close to its sunset. We're getting to that point where those are not necessarily the issue. The, the next one was our seat needs. We needed to make sure we had seat needs, predominantly at the elementary level, so that's why those projects were there, followed by um, our aging infrastructure. We ha we've, we've, we had some of the oldest infrastructure in the state. That's not something I like saying because that doesn't feel like a badge of honor. My bad, the badge of honor we have is whatever buildings we have, we're gonna provide the most quality education for our students each and every day. The work that's happened with this program and the previous ones have helped us make a dent in those. AC, seats at the elementary level, um, systemic projects, roof, boilers, chillers, we certainly don't want to exclude those because not every school is going to be rebuilt. So we need to make sure the ones that we have, we keep up and going with chillers, boilers, um, doors, windows, and things of that nature. And then the, the, the last, well not the last, the final one is high school seats are now with uh, uh, Dr. Brown indicated in the study that we're, we're needing somewhere in the neighborhood of 1,700 seats at multiple locations. So, so now we've got to incorporate that into that, which is, that was outside of the, um, you may or may or may not be familiar with Schools for Our Future. That was the 1.3, now $1.6 billion initiative. That is 
totally exclusive. That, that is what we had. High schools is added on top of that. So the 1.6 is not inclusive of high school dollars. So that's a new discussion that will have to take place with our state and local funding agencies and this board as well. Okay, so you answered a, a fantastic question, um, just not the one I was trying to get at. Sure. So in July, my understanding is that as a result of the not commission, the, um, well, currently, the Board of Public Works is no longer in charge of public school construction funding. Correct. And in July is due to the IAC, um, which has taken over what was the Board of Public Works Authority, is due a priority list of schools across the state. And my understanding of that is that that priority list will rank all the schools across the state against each other according to a very complicated formula. When those rankings come out, how do you expect those rankings of all the schools in the state to affect our priority number list? Because my understanding is that ranking of those priority numbers will list all the schools in the state against each other according to a complicated school sufficiency standard formula and that w ranking will determine which schools are eligible for state funding as opposed to the way we have done it in the past which is the counties determined the LEAs determined their own priority ranking so what i want to know is what impact do you feel that that will have on our next state budget cycle and then possibly the priority orders of these numbers so let me, let me, let me, let me start first. Okay. first. First of all, that, that is something that we've heard and we've been working with the state as it relates to that. So as that evolves, we'll certainly present that information to this board. Secondly, we already have a 2014 facilities assessment. So for us, we're a little, we're a little bit ahead of the game as it relates to what our inventory of needs are. Not saying that that, that, is, that won't factor into what the state is doing, but we're, we're not approaching this from a standpoint where we're waiting for, uh, for them to tell us what our needs are. We, we know what our needs are based on that assessment and our high school working with our schools, school communities and our principals. So for us, how that, how that ranking or categorization happens for us is just a matter of making sure that we continue the projects that we have and those that this board and the system deem necessary as we move through that process. So, do you expect that, all right, so hypothetically, let's say we have random high school mm -hmm. and we decide random high school, that's the one we wanna build. Mm -hmm. And the state comes in and says, random high school that you want to build is way down here on our list. And all these other schools have to get state funding first. Are we going to change our priorities? Are we going to have to because of state funding? The, the state formula as it relates to how that process, I don't think that's going to change. They may have a ranking. It still has to meet the, um, the, the indications that Pete, Mr. Dixon said, um, enrollment, condition of the building, um, seat, seat needs in the area. So all of those things are not gonna change. It just may mean how they have it ranked and what we have on the capital plan may not line up project for project. That's where we go through our discussions about why this makes sense and this doesn't make sense. So I don't think that that listing that the state will do will completely drive what, what our decision. It will be a part of the decision that this board will do in conjunction with our local and state partners. That's mm -hmm. absolutely correct because their process is under development. They mm -hmm. haven't finalized it. We have already done a condition assessment study, so we are that much ahead of the game. My understanding, yeah. though, is that their formula includes um, not just the facility standards, but it's a very complicated formula involving waiting overcrowding facility standards curriculum spaces and their size various safety things and and instructional needs schools might have and and that all of that very complicated almost algorithmic formula creates it and i don't think our formula is as complicated as theirs and it may not match up and my reading of what i've observed from the state and the iec documents and the not commission 
And the testimony of Dr. Lever and others that I watched as this was going along seemed to indicate to me that this was going to be a dramatic change. And I guess, um, do you feel differently? You don't think it's going to no, change? Um, it is going to change, but I'm not sure if dramatic change is the right word. Even today, even now, under the old setup, when we submit projects, there is a complex algorithm to develop construction costs for state funding. That is going to be modified to what extent they are still developing it. We are in conversation with, with them, and uh, the dramatic change perhaps is not the right term. Okay. Um, Excuse me. Uh, given the lateness of this meeting, uh, and we have covered a lot of wonderful ground, um, what I would like to suggest is that Ms. White and I work out a timeline for board members to submit questions, uh, comments uh, for submission so that we can have those available for the next work session. Um, also to coordinate the uh, submission of capital improvement program to the state um, for all of the board members. Um, so unless there's anything quickly, I would like to do that. Ms. White, is that? Acceptable, okay. So I would like to say thank you very much for all of the work that you've done. This is a very complicated process and you all work very diligently for us. And um, I think some of the things we're gonna ask for are primers for the new board on the changes from the past to, well really, to what we're looking forward to in the funding models coming from 21st Century Schools Program and the Not Commission and hopefully some additional funding uh, coming from Annapolis. So thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Moving on to our next agenda, item M, information. Uh, I would direct board members and the public to uh, board docs <laughs> where there is the, <clears throat> excuse me, Superintendent's Rule 7310, new construction. Additionally, um, for item N, announcements, the next boarding board meeting will be Tuesday, January 8th, 2019. 2019, people, um, at 6.30 p.m. right here. As we know, we already have a number of wonderful topics and we will be uh, working more on a work session for the county capital budget. Um, I just would remind board members that to please check your email. Tomorrow there'll be additional paths for you to request information. And I would also like to say that Thank you so much to the staff and to the board members um, and even to our stakeholders who have persevered through two board meetings in two weeks with new members um, in the midst of very many programs of trying to govern our very large um, and wonderful, wonderful school system. Um, also, I want to say we're grateful to all the hard work and dedication of the teachers, administrators, and each employee that supports our students. And we appreciate the efforts of our students and we acknowledge that all deserve a break to connect with family and friends, celebrate faith and family traditions, rest, relax, and prepare for a new year. So we wish all a safe and happy holiday season and best wishes for the upcoming new year. The meeting is adjourned.